Recorded live. Hello. Zephyr, is this you? Deborah, is this you? This is Rod. Hello. Hello. I'm a guest. <laughs> okay. All right, just hang in there a minute, and she should be on here shortly. Okay, I'm going to mute out, okay? Okay. Thanks. Yep. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, this is Rod, AIB Radio. And I want to bring up about the upcoming judicial reform here for July 25th, 26th, 27th here in North Carolina, up here at Cross Country Campgrounds on 150, up here in Denver, North Carolina. And this is for education. This is for us to, to bring in the congressional records, show you what's going on, about the bankruptcy, the Trading with the Enemy Act, the fact that the Federal Reserve note is not money. they are all the congressional records that lay all this stuff out. It's one thing to sit here and tell you. It's another thing to put it up on an 8x8 eight eight screen on a wall and actually show you the fraud that's being perpetrated. To sit back and show you the... Social Security Act of 1935 under Title V, under Section 501, 502, where they put that dollar amount value on you. In the Alien Registration Act of 1940, that required us to have the birth certificate. And how all this come about that shows that they have turned us into slavery in this in this country, but they have turned us into a credit line that they're embezzling. And this is part of what we're having a problem with with these courts. These courts are not operating under any law. They're operating under rule of necessity of whatever is convenient. And a lot of you people know from what we what we have done on our show, we have walked in with so much information we've dumped on these courts, well, it's always, well, that was the wrong piece. If you would have brought this up, or if you would have said this, or if you would have done this. Ladies and gentlemen, it isn't whether we should have. It's the fact that what they're doing to us out here is human rights violations. They don't have a valid complaint. They don't have the grounds to do what they're doing. And this is part of what we're bringing in on the Trading with the Enemy Act of the licensing, the registration, and for what we have showed, there is no criminal jurisdiction because if you go back into your state statutes, get into your criminal procedure, like I have in this state and several other states, it says it's being revised and be codified. In other words, they haven't created it yet. And that's the same thing with the federal side. If you get into Title 28, into the jurisdiction, you will not see one thing for criminal jurisdiction. It's all civil. You get into the venue, it says they got venue, but it still doesn't give subject matter jurisdiction. But when we look under Title 50, Chapter 3, under Alien Residence, Section 23, Jurisdiction of the Court, and that Title 50 falls under War and National Defense under the Trading with the Enemy Act. This is where they're pulling their jurisdiction and they're failing to disclose all this information. Deborah, if you're if you're on here, hit your star eight on your phone, and I will bring you in. Okay. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to bring in a special guest and going to open some of this stuff up for her to explain, lay out to you. And hopefully we can come up with some solutions to this problem dealing with this court system that we have out here. Hello, Deborah. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, Rod. How about yourself? 
Oh, we're, we're hanging in there. We're still, like I said, still doing paperwork. I haven't got a Skype from you yet, but I'll, as soon as I get it, like I said, we'll get it over to you. Yeah, when when we spoke a little earlier, I was outside of the office, and I barely could make it in time. And of course, I had to field a lot of phone calls in between now, so I, I've i been quite busy. Uh, it, you know, I've been a little behind, so forgive me, but I'm, I will get the documents to you because we, we still have more to talk about. Uh, once we're done with this call. So, anyways, uh, thank you for having me, and I'm so glad to be here and to contribute in any manner that I can. So, uh, I was just listening to what you were saying, and I would like to pick up exactly where you where you left off is, and that is absolutely right. Uh, what's happening is that uh, I'm. Let me give you just a small background. I've gotten a lot of flack from people when I tell them I'm a former attorney. Oh, you know, you're a bar member, and da 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 da. And, you know, and I tell people, you know, to calm down because those of us are realizing, you know, what we involved ourselves when we are graciously have come out of this system and a few, I can only speak to me and maybe a few more have decided that we want to help the people to expose the, you know, the fraud and the corruption that's going on and it's, and it, and it's widespread and it's enormous. So uh, many of them will not speak out because in all actuality, uh, that was an oath that we took, and an oath is um, you are conditioned to believe that you are pledging your allegiance that is to never be broken. And my stickler, my stickler is this. If the allegiance was based on fraud and corruption from the beginning, I have no allegiance to that. I didn't pledge for that. No, I didn't have full disclosure for that, for me, for me to have a better determination if I wanted to join this club or not. So, no. Uh, while others will be holding to it, I refuse not to do so. The same thing with being a police department. Let me be very clear, first and foremost, about the oath. Many officers don't remember. In fact, I didn't remember for a while because I didn't think anything of it until suddenly this started coming up in the last 15, 10, 15 years, and I thought, wait a minute. We took two oaths as police officers. We took an oath to the fraternal order first. Then the second oath was, then they administered the second oath, which is to the Constitution. And so why you can see from that point of view why they have no loyalty to the people. Okay, so first in line is first in time. So the first oath carries, not the second, the first. And that is the way with, with all the public offices. And that is the point that they will not tell you about. They take an oath to a different oath first. And then they're minister. The, and that has always been, even when I was in the federal government side, when I volunteered some time to work on the federal government for a year. Uh, again, I took an oath to protect the fraternal order. And then they administer the oath of the Constitution for us. So in actuality, we really wasn't beholden to the Constitution. It was just there because, it, you know, it was being performed by witnesses, the people. Okay, so that basically is. But the, the secret oath was a secret oath. And then we went into a different room and did that and then came out and did the, the Constitution. So there's where that lies. And there's where that problem is. And, you know, I get many people say, well, I've got friends that, you know, they never talk about it. And they're there not to talk about it. Um, like I said, they're conditioned. What helped me along was my father being in the military and my martial art instructor kept me grounded. Other than that, i probably more than likely been dead already or I'm corrupted. And I, and I had uh, a lot of mentors around me that was well grounded and they made sure that I stayed and stayed focused for the very right reason. So that's why I was able to get out and get out without... Uh, any injuries to me. I, I suffered, yeah, there were some skirmishes that I had to go through, but that's okay. But, you know, I'm alive. So that's an important fact that I got through the, the department and then various, that I did various things and then end up, because uh, when you're in the police department, they pay for you to go to school for any related I chose law. And they pick that up. They pay for that. So I thought, well, that's why I took advantage of it. And I thought I will make some changes when I get into it, not realizing what really opened my eyes is when I was with Senator Moynihan and I was on his legislative board. And occasionally I have to accompany him to Washington, D.C. And it was there I thought, 
What have I stepped into here? What is this? And who is these things that's running around looking like humans, looking like us, but they're not? That opened my eyes, and I thought, oh, my God. And I couldn't tell. I, and they said, you can't tell what you see here. And I thought, oh, oh, how do I get out of this? You know, so I kept my mouth shut, and I, I figured out a plan, and I said, okay, I've got to make it work for me. At some point, i got to, in order to defeat your enemy, you've got to get in to defeat it from the inside without, you can't do it from the outside. So that was kind of one of my strategies. And, and I said, well, I hope to live so that I can do it. And so I maintained, I did what I needed to do, but I made sure that it didn't tither and me having to have to wear with, to the point that I had to endure karma because I'm very much into that. So, but long story, I've been with this pretty much my entire life. My, my mother was into the government. So I grew up in the government. I, I, I know how they think. I know how to feel. I know how they write. I know how they speak. I know what their game plans are. I, I'm just, I consider myself one of them in some regards because I grew up with it as a child. Uh, and my mother wasn't, uh, well, I can't even speak about some of the things that she done. I don't even know what she really done for the government, but whatever she saw or whatever experimentation that, she, you know, she was indoctrinated to, I was experimental for her when she came home. Okay, so it, it was a very ugly sight, and I said, how can I change this? So that has always been my motivation to change it, but you have to do it from within. So I've gotten a lot of flack, and, well, you're still one of them, but, you know, every so often you still look like a cop, you know, and, and I said, you know, I'm not your enemy. There's a bigger enemy out there than me, <laughs> and you might want to, you know, direct that, that energy there because if anybody's going to help you, it's going to be me. It's not going to be someone that's never been there. It would be someone like me. So if I were you, I'd calm down. <laughs> because you're going to need our help, the ones that's been there. So this is where I have decided to step out and step forward. And I'm not worried about fear at all. (laughs) So I've been through some skirmishes as a woman, (laughs) and I've got gunshots, stab wounds, (laughs) fractured jaws. (laughs) I've got, (laughs) you know, that's in my body. So I've got the scars to prove it and many medical reports to prove that as well, to back that up. So anyway, so I want to go ahead and, and talk about uh, what Ron has talked about just now because it, it's the very prevalent. I don't know if any of you know uh, Dr. Henderson who's kind of starting to begin to address some of these issues so they just understand that some paperwork was just uh, deposited into the court um, a few days ago, on Monday, I think yesterday, uh, into District 26, in Louisiana that he's now been acknowledged the head of the world court. So he's looking to really so seriously make some changes here. But at the moment here, we're trying to gather momentum, and there's small groups that are trying to handle this issue, and the courts are enormously corrupted. I'm also being aware that John Ward Roberts, uh, Chief Justice, is having a turn code, and so he wants to begin to address uh, the corruptions of the courts. They're afraid right now. I was told by several people that I've gotten emails and phone calls they are to come to work armed. Uh, some people called me and said, what do I do? And I think, why call me? Call the people that you've been working for. Ask them. <laughs> Don't call me. Uh, frankly, have you harmed someone? <laughs> yeah, I guess you would be looking at what kind of weapon. In that case, get a gun. <laughs> Maybe you want to help us all out. You can go ahead and end your life now. So they go, well, that's cool. I says, well, it's even cruel what you guys have been doing for many years, for decades. And you want me to be sympathetic? <laughs> Don't think so. So anyways, they're very, very, very frightened. I sent out the memo, and apparently I was told that somebody, the right people got that memo, and I actually started asking to have the courts closed. Because the first thing they feared is about closure. These courts don't want to be closed. Closure is the greatest fear for them. When the people realize and wake up and said, so we have no business with these people. We can't air our, re- our, our grievances there. What's the point? Close them. 
And so apparently maybe some of the memo or maybe happened to happen coincidental with other things that's taking place that it's, it's being taken serious. So there's a number of grassroots uh, uh, groups out there that's addressing this issue, so don't be despair, but just walk with your head up high. So I'm going to share to you why. Um, I may not be able to cover everything because we've got uh, 120 hours. I mean, good Lord, 120 minutes, 60 minutes. Uh, two hours here, so there's much, you know, that must be discussed, and so that's going to require several um, updates and, and more talks and discussions about that. Also, I am teaching classes on this stuff, so I kind of get into more depth. I take two days, two and a half days when people come and take the class, and I really dive into it. But uh, the question is regarding uh, your status as a, as a, a corporate fiction entity that you are and you are strong. And at this point in junction, here's where the court is at this point, okay? I've been out warning, you know, various these gurus that was teaching these courses, hey, you guys got to align yourself and come together because they're going to come after you like a bowling pen. They're going to take you all down. And every one of them that I gave one or two has been in and out of prison at this point. I said, because you guys ain't coming together like you need to operate like one organism, and you're not. And you're easy to take down. Very easy. You know, martial arts, for me, uh, when you're surrounded by enemies, the, you, you, you size up the biggest person in the room. You don't take out the small one. You size up the biggest one. You take the, the biggest and the strongest out, the rest will just run like rabbits. That's how you learn. Uh, for any of you who've been into martial arts, and I don't know which style, but there's various styles of them, too, too many to, to mention here. One of the greatest styles I studied was Aikido and I teach Jiu-Jitsu. I mean, uh, Jiu-Jitsu and I teach Jiu-Jitsu. And I got into Kung Fu, so it was all about size and power. And as a woman, uh, we had to do everything we can to make it to leverage that fight. And I said to every one of my instructors, I said, I don't care what technique you teach me, just teach me that all I want is to be able to have hit, make one punch. I don't care where I hit that person on the body. Something is going to break. That's what I am. Because I don't want to stand there and tough and round on the ground, uh, rolling around like I'm in a wrestling match. You know, I, I want to be out. I want to be in and I want to be out. Because you've got a lot of work. You've got the size to do it. You've got speed. you already got strength. And so anytime I got into scuff, I took out the biggest person. So much so I got so good at this. I could never, when I used to spar, they could never put me in with another female because I hit so hard. I wanted to make sure I could master one punch that I seriously injured her. So anytime I got into a ring, I had to only spar with the guy. Keep competing again with the guy. So... I took a lot of what I've learned in the martial arts and I brought it into this realm, this law, to use it to my advantage. And it worked pretty good. And it kept me safe. So this is how they managed to go around systematically taking out the groups. Their theory, you take the head, the party will fall. And that's essentially, you know, that's a, that's a war tactic, martial arts tactic, whatever it is. And I've been going out warning, and they've been laughing at me. Were you one of them? You were a spy, and all on, on and on and on. Okay, well, no problem. <laughs> you know, but I guarantee you somebody's going to call me from your camp in a couple of months, if not years from now. But I'll get that call. And I always did. I always have. And maybe not so much eventually out here over time. Oh, yeah, the person, he's da 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 da. They brought him up on false charges, and, which is already what I know. So. Unfortunately, it goes back to that birth certificate because what everyone has forgotten, the sepulchre of the trust is their creation, all of it, even your name. Of course, they had to identify, separate it from the Christian appellate name to make it sound, be different from something else. It, had to, it may look similar in style, but when it's pronounced, it sounds identical. Idiom sonus, that's Latin for identical sound when pronounced. On, when on paper, we can see 
spelling, decorate all, decorate all uppercase to proper case. You, we often say, hey, that's, a, that's not how to spell my name. We usually say, that's not how to spell my name. So they trick you with so they trick you with sound. Then okay, well, we have to use, we have to use vocals. So we have to get them into court, and we can only have vocal administration, not written paper, because they will come in here and say, this is incorrect, this is not proper now, and you can you can absolutely uh, 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 revoke going into court, but they have to use various tricks to get you in that place. How could they do that? It went through the Latin language and came up with this word, indio, idiom, sona. Identical sound when you say it. So when someone says, hey, Deborah, naturally, by from sound, I'm going to respond because I'm not clear that they're saying, pronouncing my name in the uppercase via to the proper case, upper, lower case. It sounds identical. But because I've been trained, when it has a certain tone, like it's, each word is being pronounced, I've been trained where you guys have not. So I know, no, no, that's not, uh, no, that's not me. Where the most of you will raise your hand or say, I'm here, I'm present, and that's a switch and bait. Bingo. We were trustees. We just now got you to be trustees. So basically, you are alive with all the liabilities that are beheading you. So we want to charge you now because I'm going to be the beneficiary, even though we created a trust. So now it brings us back to paper versus flesh that no one has been talked about or it wasn't been introduced well enough for you to get how they really switch and bait. You got idiom, idiom sonus going on, identical sound when it's only pronounced. They don't want anything on written form, so they have done everything they can to only get everyone to respond verbally. Nothing on paper because if it's written, it's constructive fraud from the beginning, and you can see it. You will recognize it. So how can we trick these people? And we go out here, we spin up their inheritance, and then trick them into accepting the bill. How can we do that? What are some of the tools that we can do? So they came up with various schemes. Another one is called disparato non debet janje. <laughs> that means dissimilar things are not to be joined because you don't understand flesh and paper. And flesh and paper is, okay, let's go back to the corporation being founded. Washington, D.C. is not a physical. It's a four square piece of paper that's being filed in a cabinet, someone's shelf. That's what Washington, D.C. is. They have living bodies to make it come alive, but it's a piece of paper. A vessel flying in a sea of space, take a piece of paper in your hand and then let go. It's a vessel flying in a sea of space. When it lands, when that piece of paper lands, now turn to the paper and say, I need you to dance for me. Dance. Get up and dance for me. If anyone sees that piece of paper getting up and dancing, that's fine. <laughs> you know, let me know. In order for that piece of paper to become life, to have life, it takes a living, breathing male or female to reach down and pick up that piece of paper. Now it's come to life. You gave it life. You are pushing around their paper trust. Everything that is in your pocket or whatever you're carrying, whatever you claim is yours, is spelled in all uppercase. DC and all of the subsidiary agencies are created the same way on paper. It is an entity, it is a fiction entity, and because it is, maximum of law means you can only deal with of like kindness. Now, <laughs> You, everybody who's claiming to be sovereign or secure party creditor, a living, breathing male and female. We got a 
we have a fiction going on that is artificial, and we have a live person. How can you possibly interact? And yet, because you fail to go beyond the skills that they have given you, they taught you how to read and write, you didn't pick up on the, the game they're playing, which you should have been able to do. This is how they've seen it. These are not my words. And I'm sharing with you how they see it. You're wise enough to realize you're being tricked. You're being deceived. You've been lied to. We gave you something of value, which you didn't take from, you, you, took, you just took it for granted. You didn't extend yourself. So, okay, we'll go ahead. You're looking to be prayed on, and we're going to pray on you. Prayer, P A. <laughs> Prayer. <laughs> it really means pray. <laughs> P-R-E-Y, not A. <laughs> they also get into a lot of wordsmithing. There's lots of hidden coded messages in words. Like the word, give you another, welcome. Take out the L. You have we come. We're coming from you. Okay, now. So we've got a paper trying to in- interact with someone, a flesh. Blood coursing through their veins, living and breathing. How can that be? They created a, a they created an organization that cannot interact with you at all. Everything they have given you is based on has been on paper. Washington D.C. is on paper. It is filed in a cabinet somewhere. You gave it life. Hmm, Washington D.C. is doing this to me. Washington D.C. is doing that to me. We're sitting back laughing. I am. I don't say anything until I start teaching this course, and then I have to expose this and tell you what it really is. So you come up. You're now going, you get a piece of paper that says you're summoned. You don't really understand what that institution is. You didn't take the time out. You you said you are a living, breathing, sentient being, sovereign, and act, you're acting like a slave because a slave are uh, ignorant of facts that you've chosen to not to go beyond yourself, which you were given the greatest gift of reading and writing, and you choose not to do so. You got comfortable in your zone rather than extending yourself. Because as you just said, you could realize what's really going on here. You've been created on paper. How could we possibly interact? What should have been happening from the beginning should have been paper to paper. We've got paper to flesh. Now, this is how they don't honor anything. Nothing at all. And they don't have to. I'm going to give you some of those reasons why. In their twisted mind, these are not mine. I'm just sharing with how they function. This is how the deception is widespread that it is, corrupted and colorful that it is. And they've got many facets. In case you uncover this one, there is another in the backup waiting to overthrow it. And also, at the same time, the FBI is playing a role, major role. They go to these various agencies and, make, and tell them, you need to shift your game plan. You need to change this up. You need not to have this consistently where you get all these wins. And I've had many colleagues that have gone to court, they won hands down, citing bursts of cases, statutes, and codes, only to come back in there the very next day with a similar case to be arrested. <laughs> so there's many of these agencies are working conglomerate together. They work, they work as one mechanism, many of them, and they put their input because you fail to realize who is doing what, who is who. You can't even identify who's supposed to be who. Not alone, you don't even didn't even take out the time out of they claim to have all these officers and nobody really understands what these officers really supposed to do. The accountability was lost both on their side and the people's side. Both everyone is involved here. And there's accountability on both sides. We the people and the fiction entity that they are. They are artificial. And in some miracles ways they have been telling you this and no one has been listening listening. It has been said by the Supreme Court many times over, many case law, and I can get it to anyone that wants it. There's many case law from the beginning of the establishment of the, the Supreme Court. They have been citing 
that everything that Washington, D.C., the agents that are writing words that will spell on a piece of paper has all been illegal. And they've been fighting over and over and over. Just a simple arrest, being arrested is technically assault on you. Many cases where cases were thrown. When I came out of New York, it was properly known. If you're going to arrest somebody, you're going to get, you're going to have, you have to know hand-to-hand combat because people are not going to take kindly to be an arrest. I was the last person that arrested anybody. So I did my little tricks with them too. Oh, yes, I did. I played my little game because I knew how this was going to go down because I knew if I could court there was a pretty good chance that that person was going to walk because the moment they said there was there's a sex of beat, and even the judges, if a person came, to, it was unheard of when a person came to court and his head is the size, you know, his 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 head is three times larger, his eyes are black, and he's, his arm is in a cast. The judge automatically say, this is abusive, this is obsessive. Where are those police officers? I want criminal charge. It was known back in my time. Judges automatically would dismiss cases, so we weren't so quick to put our hands on people, not at all, because they could get off. And then the, New York was being constantly being sued, consistently. Might you? Yes, there was a few times <laughs> they accused me of police brutality. But when the judges learned how I move and maneuver that. They go, well, technically she didn't, she just didn't come out and strike, strike you. There was an agreement. And what I did was I said, I got a game. We want to like to play it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, if you can get the first punch off, because many, and back in those days, men fear police women. Because they said, well, you know, the men will tackle it, but the women, because, you know, we're much bigger and stronger, they're going to run for the side off, right? And they said, you know, if you didn't have that gun belt, I'd whoop the crap out of you. And I go, oh, I like this game. This is how I did it. I said, really? And the guy's like, oh, God, no, no, no. You just let us just arrest you. You're going to be embarrassed. It's like, what? Okay, you're telling me this little girl going to, we're not going to arrest you. The agreement is we will honor it. So I said, okay, if I drop my gun belt and you get the French p- first punch off, you get to walk. No, no, I think that's easy enough. I said, now, if I get the first punch off, I'm going to add charges on that. Well, 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 well I don't know about that. Said, yeah, you agreed to do bodily harm to me. I didn't. I didn't do that. You did. We have an agreement? Yeah. You sure? Yeah, I'm sure. Before he was able to say, yes, I'm sure, I had my gun belt and dropped to the ground, he was laid out. That's how I did it. So, you know, there's some people like, well, of course, I used to get sanctioned a lot when I was in New York. What do you think this is? You crazy? What did you lose your mind? You're going to go fight me at the elevation? Who does this? What da, 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 da. So I knew the game. Because I knew that eventually I was going to be sued for police brutality. But when it was all, witnesses would come forward and say, yeah, he's crazy. He's doing a crazy thing. He's doing a crazy thing. He's sitting there laughing like, oh, my God. <laughs> he did it. He did it. He did it. He tried to turn. She took him up on it. And, you know, who would have thought that woman said, you know, we didn't even see her hit him. So, <laughs> and that was always the case. We didn't see her hit him. Because, I, you know, I worked on when I meant to say that I want to hit you with one punch, I worked on speed. I wanted to see that who could catch me, who could see me hitting someone. And that's what always went up in court. I did. All we saw this guy was on the ground. It happened so fast, we didn't even see who hit them. So this is how I kind of managed to wiggle my way around. So I took part, but I did it in a clever manner. <laughs> so... The system is, is was designed that way, you know, and uh, when I realized what I had took part in, uh, a fraternal order, rather than you know, thinking that I'm not here to protect and serve, I was very disenchanted every day that I served, and I wanted out. There's a couple of things that happened I couldn't get right out um, because I was told that if I leave, I left with some knowledge, and there's a possibility I may not see the next day. So I thought, okay, well, let me stay in and figure out another angle here. So, you know, 
we everyone don't see the they don't see everything. And it's just speculation, and I'm not giving excuses about what the cops are doing today. What, what, they, what they're doing today is horrible, it's horrific. Um, you know, and here in Vallejo, they're just coming up, coming out of cars and gunning uh, blacks down and then jumping back in the cars and leaving just like that in broad daylight. Keep saying it. it's not hitting mainstream news. So it's horrific what they're doing. But the system has designed in a manner that it did a switch and bait, trick you into having flesh versus paper, you none the wiser. So what they did was got you to accept everything with a verbal agreement. So anytime you got pulled over, the officer said, well, I'm going to give you a ticket. You're going to show up for court. But remember, there was always a verbal communication that took place. And you say yes, and you signed. <laughs> okay, so getting back to the paper, what, how it's supposed to have been happening is that because they're fiction, your answer to them should have been of like kind. But instead, people none the wise that didn't study, they none of, had no idea what, the, what that system was all about, didn't care to extend themselves, so they flesh and body showed up in court. So the judge, clerks, bailiffs, prosecutor looking at each other go, hmm. Name is still on the case. We got a dissimilar thing that ought not to be joined. Well, well since we're just going to we're going to have a verbal hearing. That's why the, all courts are verbal. They are verbal, not written. People say, why they don't have the because they both have scribe oath and a verbal oath, but they tricked everyone when they came up with the the CQV because they knew that they was going to trick. And the trick is how when Roosevelt accepted everybody turned into the gold, and they said all person. Well, unfortunately, because you were none the wiser, every one person didn't understand their legal definition of what a person was at that time. It was another trick. So persons, everyone thought it was all everyone. It was actually designed for corporate Businesses weren't designed for man, living, woman that was private. It actually was corporate. But when all householders came and turned in their gold, they thought, ooh, oh, this plan is working better than we give credit to it. So they realized, ooh, we got to use words more often but a little more crafty. Today, Ron can tell you what the word person really means. It means a boom. Anything now at this point is a person. Surprises me that the Supreme Court, maybe I shouldn't be surprised, I'm not surprised, made, stated that, you know, made a judicial ruling that persons is now acceptable. But I'm sorry, excuse me. Uh, you're going to tell me a broom can, be, can claim injury? Can you go into court and claim injury? I mean, this is, the stuff is sinister. But they did a lot of wordsmithing with words. It means one thing in the in the academic dictionaries, but they have black law dictionary that has a totally different meaning, which is legalese. Two distinct differences. And you're talking about apples and oranges when in comparison how the word is being used. And then you have to look at the, the sentence. This is where they said none the wiser. So they realize you are really incompetent. You really can't read and write, and you can't even comprehend what you read. So why am I about to put it on paper? Because you can see the fraud very clearly if you could articulate it. If you were really comprehending reading, you could see the fraud from the beginning, ab initio. Because you can't read and write, hmm, okay, the trick must go on. This game's going to go on. Now we're going to demand that you come into courts with attorneys because you can't read and write. You don't comprehend. You can't even comprehend the fraud that's being played on you. We know you're incompetent. So there's several many facets of jurisdiction going on. So getting back to Nine the Bent, John Day, because of dissimilar things, it relieves them of adhering to any statutes, codes, and regulation pertaining to both you or them. Because 
it's equivalent of being in a contract. And the breaching party has committed an atrocious, deceptive lies from the beginning. They had an intent to derail the contract. And then they turn to you and say, but you must apply. You must be honest. You need to compel performance for you. You can't do that. And you people did. The other party has already breached the contract. There is no contract. There's no contractual obligation on your part at all. You don't have to honor anything. You could simply said no. But again, you didn't extend yourself from the gift that they gave you how to read and write. You came along, showed up, and go. they go, oh, there's a body here. He's dead. Those of you who are familiar now, we all know that an uppercase means that you're dead. It means also that you're a corporate entity fiction of which they created. So going into their courts, you didn't understand that you're no longer on the soil of America. You're on a ship, on a vessel. The judge is the captain. And those are very other roles. The judge has many, the judge has whatever role he chooses to be. You never ask the question, what role are we playing here today? Who are you today? No, none of you did that. You went in and said, hey, when they, sell, when they did it, is it uh, idiom sonus on you, identical sound. We know you're going to respond to that because on paper you can reject it, and they know they have no contractual agreement. They can't will you in on that because on paper you can see that is not my name and I'm not responded, but they did a sonus on you, sound. So they got you to start listening and not seeing and you all went along with it. So the judge is five different roles, but you don't know what role it is because you don't even know the venue is because you didn't know you couldn't read or write. <laughs> They're playing games on you, magician, sorcery, summoning you. <laughs> you have no idea where you are. <laughs> you don't know. You, you, you are technically, you're trespassing on our territory. Yes, we're going to treat you accordingly. We're going to punish you. We're going to penalize you. You're on a vessel. You don't have proper papers to be here. All of that. Because if you did, maybe you might uncover that the states aren't states. Each 50 states are a country of its own, if you knew that. And in actuality, we all should be walking around with passports. So when you leave California go to Arizona, you need to have a passport, not a driver's license of California going into Arizona. <laughs> but you don't know, because you don't know you don't you can't read and write. It's you know, it, to me it's a simple I was able to see it, but I, I, anyways, we'll talk about me. I go home every night thinking, how can you people not see this? This is so flagrant. And there was points that I didn't even see it. But I quickly wake up because I always ask questions. And I'm thinking, how can we help this without uh, without breaching our own contractual agreement here until I can get out of the system? Because I can't come and help you if I'm still in their system. Can I? Uh, Deborah? Because, yes. Okay. Now, with a lot of what you're sitting here saying, the problem of it is none of this stuff is taught. I know. In, in, in any of these schools. So what we're what we're dealing with here is that whenever we and I, we've had people on the calls and we know people that has refused to contract and you and I've talked about this is that these people get beat by the cops, they get drugged in, they get handcuffed. So, you know, there is really at this point our problem of it is is that even if we don't contract we're forced into contract by threat, duress, and beatings. Yeah, I have a few clients that have taken beatings, and every one of the charges, uh, even being shipped around on buses, you know, across America for six months to eight months, are all out alive and well and no longer in that system because one of them, when I first told him to start saying no, I don't consent. If anything else, if they take your fingerprint and let them take it, and you, while they're taking your fingerprint, say, I do not consent, I do not consent to the proceeding, and on and on and on and on and on. And he took a beating, went to the hospital, now he's popping all kinds of charges, and he's pursuing it. 
And some judges have said, okay, you know, we can see exactly what is going on. So, you know, unfortunately, I know a lot of what I brought here, very little has been talked about because much of it has been very hidden very well. And it's only myself and a few other people that have decided to, well, actually, the, the my senior trainer is not teaching this anymore, so he passed it on and said, I want you to go ahead and, you know, start educating people really about the, the correct truth about this. Who brought this to me was a federal judge. That's how we found out. Because I, at the point, didn't know about the five Latin terms either, and actually how this game was really being played, we too, uh, you know, on a need-to-know basis. So when you look at the whole scheme of things, unfortunately, what they have you on is that everything you're pushing the government trust, everything of of yours that you're claiming is yours, is not yours, is of their creation. Do you recognize as such you're all incompetent, you're ward of the state, enemy of the state, and you're an orphan? The judge is an uh, the judge can be the administrator, the trustee, the landlord, the banker, and the Talmudic priest. That's what the judge is. Until you find out where you are and you learn how to comprehend reading and figure out this game, you can't read them right. And they treat you as such. And when you go before the judge, you're a ghost. Who is this ghost standing in front of me yapping? He's supposed to be dead. This is why people come to me and judge yell at me and say, I'm not supposed to speak. And I can't say why that is. I just smile and go, mm, yes, I know it's not supposed to be that way, but unfortunately, if you knew what I really know, then you are, you, it's not, I'm not in agreement with it, but this is where they're coming from, because they're coming from that fraud, that illusion. They are an illusion, and you gave life to them. Well, see, this is where part of the problem's coming in because the majority of the people, and when I got started into this in 2001, we assumed the court was honest, and if they're using statutes according to the Constitution and and what we've learned in their rule books, is that these are supposed to be court of law, and we should be able to use the law as a defense because that's what they're using against us to drag us in. And we're finding out that as long as we don't push, they do whatever. But if we bring up an issue later on, it's, well, if you had brought this up in court, then things would have been different. And the people that know me, that we have dumped in the kitchen sink, the bathtub, the, the sewer, the house, you know, everything in this on all their rules. And we're, we're coming in that... There is no sort of rules at all in this court of how they are operating. I'm going to tell you, they never had intended to do it. That it was never for you to, for you guys to go in for, to have redress at all. They had to let this thing play out until the timing was right for the bankers to come together and format this plan to be solid that it will not be overturned. To make sure that you people never knew that you were slated and that you were pushing the government. Uh, pushing the government trust around, so they had to play along. All of us knew this. We knew that you really, it wasn't ever designed for you to go in there and you have redress, not you. You were just going to be criminalized. You were going to be treated like authors and slaves and dead peoples and wolves of the state and enemy of the state, but we also have to play it along. So occasionally people will get a win, even though we are all looking back and, okay, because, if, again, if people who was really teaching this stuff if they really, really would, would really take it in the right place, you will see that the United States Code is not law. Never has. It was never rectified. If you don't have United States Code, you don't have CFR either. Now, how can you have law if you don't have lawful money? This is something that maybe perhaps the average person should have been able to detect that. This, this About is- that? So... It, is a, it, it was. It was a. It's a. It was a clever scheme over the people eyes. That it was, and because right now you can ask any attorney. Some judges are now telling you now. I mean, I hear people. I say, just go and ask the judge. Say, look, can I have some time with you after when your case over? I tell people, hang out, and people have come back 
It's not my story. I tell them record it so I can tell the truth about it. They have hung out, wait to the courtroom, empty out, said, Your Honor, I have a question. Can I ask you? Can we talk openly? The judges have said, You know, we're operating out of color law. Many of the judges will say, Hell yes, yeah, nobody's here but you and me. Yes. We're operating out of color law. Some judges have a openly admitted in a full court, in full, full, I mean, uh, the courtroom full have openly admitted. Others have said, You know, uh, talk to me in my chambers or wait till everybody cleared out, included the bailiff, make sure that the the stenographer wasn't there. I've had many people, and I tell them, put your phone on, record it. Record it so people can hear. The judge is telling you. The bailiff is telling you. People going to prison, they volunteer. This system has to look and appear that it's based on volunteerism. And it's other than that, because people can't read and write, this is how they're hoodwinking you guys. And it's unfortunate because when you're in the system, you cannot speak out against the system. Again, first in line is first in time. We took an oath to the fraternal order first. That's our allegiance. We were stuck like Chuck, some of us. Many of them. Well, see, this is part of the problem here because, like I said, as the average citizen out here, right, they got to hold down a regular job, work, you know, do the eight-hour, ten-hour mom-and-pop thing. When they're not trained in the law. They're not trained in the verbiage. You know, and we know that there's a different language between the court system and the real world out here. And we know that they've changed the definitions, but yet, you know, we, even though we got a lot of these dictionaries, <laughs> Still goes then to the judge doesn't want to follow their own wording and their own their own guidelines when we bring them up because it's like I said it's it's a fictional world here it, it's a piece of paper and they really don't have to follow because we're not part of the bar association see that's that's part of our problem that we're running into yeah I know unfortunately they're going to continue to do this in this manner under this provide and not the bench John Day here's the problem. If you are sovereign and secure party credit or any of that thing, you are not to have court in open court in the first place. That's why they still treat you as you are because you still don't have a full understanding of how the whole thing works. When any time I have gone into the court myself, I got a diplomat, I got a diplomat status. When I go to court, they sign me on a, they schedule me to make sure that I'm the only person there that entire day. They schedule no other hearings on the day. That's one way that they handle that. The second way, it goes into the chambers. It's a private conversation because you are a private member, you are a private citizen, and they are public, and they can't interfere with you. One of the games, okay, the problem is that when they issue you paper, you should have been issuing paper back, but you didn't know you thought that they trick you with verbiage and said you, you, you promised to show up. So they know that everybody is beholding to oaths. Everybody likes to know that they're honest, and we all, I believe everybody's honest. Unfortunately, this system has corrupted so many people. They don't come in and go in. They don't know what to do, what to think anymore. That's the unfortunate part. But they know that for most people, they're very honest. You said, you said because we were all conditioned to believe that if you, you gave your promise, you fulfilled that promise. So if the promise comes to you or that agent, Agent Smith comes to you and says, you promised to show up for court, you, you, you absolutely said, yeah. Not knowing what you were getting into, had no idea that that whole organization, that whole vessel thing, is all fictional. Well, it's you're right, but it's false. the problem of it is, the moment you don't show up, they put a warrant out for your arrest, piece of paper, and you've got two warm bodies coming down there, kicking in your door and handcuffing you, dragging you out. Yeah, and the reason that is being because, again, you had no idea to extend yourself beyond, so... When you get a ticket, you must turn it in within three days. That ticket should have been the original ticket, and this is what I teach my students. I teach a class, and when people get tickets, they call me right away. I say, make sure you call me right away. Send the ticket in. We create a pleading. We have a cover sheet of pleading. One copy goes directly to the DA of the area where supposedly, um, the supposedly this infraction occurred, a copy goes to the DA, a copy goes to the court. 
But instead, people showed up. Again, you've been tricked. You didn't know it. You didn't know it was a game, but you can read or write. And yet, you know, we hook, we hook seeking you. We hook wicking you. So you keep coming in and not learning this game. So, uh, and that's where it should have never been. It should have been administrative, like you said, taking it to the court. I'm not coming in there, but here's your ticket back, and I refuse. Like, then you, if you forgot that there's a three-day contract law. And nothing on the planet moves. I mean, everything on the planet is contract. Nothing on the planet moves without a contract. Everything on the planet is a contract, whether it's a verbal or whether it's written. Whether it's I shake my left leg, you shake your left leg, and you know, as an agreement, or we we shake hands, left hand to left hand, maximum things of like kindness. If I wink my left eye, you wink your left eye as an agreement. Those are contracts. Everything on this planet is a contract. Everything. So we thought, in their minds, I'm only saying them. We've, we thought we were giving you something, teaching you how to read and write. We didn't really want to take everything, but I mean, we did many, many years ago. We were hoping that we, we could, you could rise up and figure out this game and help us out here a little bit so we can correct our actions here. But unfortunately, it didn't happen. People got complacent, you know, they voted them in and then trust them to be accountable for their actions. You act in a fox to be accountable <laughs> and to got a bond of chickens. And then we left and said, okay, we're going to continue to do our lives. But, you know, if you look back in history how tribal, back many years when, you know, pilgrims and whoever's came across territories and they settled down in an area and in another group they would come and settle their area. And we took one person from the tribe that represents the tribe and that tribal member would go and exchange with other tribal members, and they would have their converse, and then they would come back and each report it to the tribe. And the whole tribe took part in the conversation and how they rule and the decisions making and on and on and on. But so the people today left that to the very people they entrust to God the chicken. Instead of taking part in that and being on it and make sure, just like a parent on a child, when a child comes home, you don't leave it at its demise. You find out, you give it discipline. You say, okay, honey, you have homework? Let's see it. Sit down and do your homework. Let me review your homework. And then you give that child chores. And then whatever's left over, they've got time to play. You love a child to play. And then when it's bedtime, honey, they still go to bed. You, you feed the child and you get up in the morning. You raise the child. You prepare the child for the day. You make sure the child has their homework, they have their lunch, and then you off to running. It's the same, the same way that we function on a day-to-day basis is how we should then monitoring them as well. But the people decided, okay, we got some places, let them handle it. They seem to be there well. They've created law. But there's a bigger picture here, <laughs> but I'm not going to get into that right now. But there's even a more bigger picture here. The, what's really, really going on? What they're doing is on the physical, but there's still so much more. Well, let's let me let me ask some questions here. I don't know, and because how do I want to say it? I, I don't want to put you on a spot, but you know we're we're sitting here talking. We talked about lawyers, and I had Karen Hood, and I talked to other AJ and some other. And I told I asked them about their college degree and their college education. Were you Ooh. taught law actually in school? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> well, no, because this is something that we're running into. You know, is we are actually taught laws, you taught theory and concept. You know, and this is very significant because from the the public defenders that I've had, they admitted that they were never taught law. They were taught theories and concept of law, and that is a big difference between what law is, theory and concept. You're right, you agree. It is absolutely in the same way with the police department, same same way with any supposedly law enforcement, that is, it's the name they give it. Sounds nice, but it's anything but law. Nobody's teach law. You don't have law. You don't have any lawful money. You are taught theory. When you go to law school, you don't sit that we will never, ever taught. You came in with fifty pages. Or you will never to this day go to any law firm and see them sit there and read your entire 50 pages. You will never see a judge do it. You would never see a prosecutor do it. And any of these 
three-letter agencies do it. We were never taught to do that. We were taught to skim, read. We miss a lot. Never can you sit there and read everything that comes through the door. That's the first principle they teach us, that first principle, going to law school, or not even law school, in colleges. You cannot sit there and read everything. Skim through, look for the key points, and then focus on that. And But they're not taught in law. They're taught in procedural. You study law. They practice it. There's a big difference, a huge difference, but the people don't know that either. You can study law and study everything you want to read because nobody tells you that's not, you shouldn't do that. You, 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 you know, that is the appropriate thing to do. However, going to many of these institutions, we were taught to skim read. You can't read everything. It's impossible because you would never get into the courtroom. You could never, you know, argue the case if you're a trial attorney or whatever your role is. You get nothing done. That's why they hired, you know, paralegals and all the AAs things and then have them to do it and have them have converse in groups and, you know, get law students and let them take care of that. That's minuscule. They don't have time for that. And that's where they skim read. You see judges go up there and go through your file. It's like hundreds of pages, and you're thinking, well, how, well, how are you going to determine this case? So if you're, not, if you're not trying to read yourself, you're not going to read what this case really is all about. No facts or truth can be tried in a court of law. It was always set up that way, but they created this, this illusion. They have to continue because the people was already conditioned that the courts were founded on the Constitution. So they have to continue to go along with that plan. Even though everything from everything that they have done, they try to demonstrate it otherwise. But they have to continue to to go along with that because everybody talked about the Constitution and the founding, uh, the framers of the Constitution and on and on and on. And so the people have been set up, conditioned, you know, with the, with the idea that, you know, founded on these principles, well, if you go into the real, go into the history, the, the Constitution has been rewritten over 104 times or more. I don't, I don't remember the exact number, but I can tell you it's over 100 times. And then it finally became a corporation at the at the end of the day. Yeah, because no, with with what with what you've laid out here for the first hour of you know, what you what you were taught and what you have discovered and going through, you know, the fraud of being misled and all this stuff. This is very significant because, you know, this is what what a lot of lawyers, they get into this, and I think when they realize this, the problem is it's a profession and you just don't want to walk out of it because there's money to be made. But on the other hand, you're hurting your client. But when we have brought some of this stuff up, and including myself, when we walk, sit down, and we start actually bringing in the law books and going through the law. Well, we don't use that. Well, this is what you're charging me under. These are the definitions that you're using. And when you get into these definitions, you know, and you and I were talking that the codes are not really law. It's just they're codes. They're, they're not, they're, they're, they're just there. Uh, and this is something that we need to really get out to the people and get the people to understand. You know, you know can you elaborate on some of this? Um, cause you've talked, you talk fast. You need to slow up a little bit. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I do. I sincerely apologize. Thank you. I, I, I'm a New Yorker. You just <laughs> I'm a New Yorker all the way, and I do. I sincerely apologize. I get into that all the time, and uh, people talk. I got even colleagues that say, "Please slow down. Shut up and slow down." I do apologize. Please tell me when I'm doing so because I'm my thoughts are flowing, and when my thoughts are flowing, I'm going 100 miles an hour, and if nobody, I think everybody's on the same page until someone says so. Let me know. And I try to do my best to slow down and get the information to you, but I got so much that I want to get out. We only Hello. got a short window to do that, and so, and you, you might miss some of that. And I do apologize. Yeah. Uh, so let me. Let's, yeah, but no, if we can get into the, where the codes are not really, I, and sort of elaborate to the people on some why the codes are not laws, because that's what we're being charged under. That's what we're being drugged into these courts for child ser- child services. And you know mortgages and criminal charges, you name it. That's what they're bringing us in under. Yes, I. Yes, I know. Um, first and foremost, codes. There's only a few who know, and even for 
uh, it's been said that only really some of the only few of the justices even know, well, just us, J-U-S-T, U-S, not justice, just us. There's another word smithing. Codes only mean that there's only a few who know what it really interprets it to. The rest of us are just fetching around in the dark. It is whatever you say it is, but there's only a few that knows it. And the rest of it is just regulation statutes. Because you don't have any lawful money. You can't have law, legal law, and be enforceable and imprison people and penalize them without lawful money, and yet they've been doing it all the time. But the Supreme Court when everyone, when, you know, a few was listening, had said that everything they have done out of Washington, D.C., the agent that's pushing around this corporation themselves, they think of all, most of their action has been illegal. There's many cases that, many of those cases that the Supreme Court has said, and they have said, why are the people coming up and backing us? We're, we're giving them ammunition to take these courts, these lower courts down. This is our opinion, Okay. Everything that the government, the corporate does is based on presumption, assumption, and opinion. Time you go to court, it says the judge render opinion, which means you, just the same way if you were to come to me and ask my opinion, you may not like it. You have the final say. You're going to say, well, you know what, I'm going to get someone else's opinion. Just that. But everybody came into court thinking that it was the, it was the gospel. They want to work. Again, it goes back into people educating themselves. I get that people want to work 10 hours a day. I, nobody can tell you more than I. I, I, do a lot of, I do a lot of things myself. I do a lot of studying myself. I got a busy schedule day, too. I, I'm not talking about today, but my schedule works almost 20 hours a day. I may get four, five, six hours of sleep. But never stop me from studying, going beyond, extending myself beyond myself and figure out something smells, something stinks here, and I want to find out about it just the same way that I came up in that system. I said, there's something wrong with this picture, and I want, to, I want to help correct it. Even though I was obligated by oath to not say anything, but it was always in my back of my mind that one day I will walk out of here and I will turn and help the people to take it down. I never lost sight. So I was just, I was working as hard like anybody else. But I still made it a goal to go after. This is how they're looking at it. This is how I'm looking at it. They got comfortable and complacent, but we've got to face the facts on that as well. We can't overlook that either. However, because there's no lawful money, it's only statutes and codes and regulation, means of the presumption. Anyone, it was as simple as this, saying no. Saying no, I, I do not accept. I do not contract. But the people that didn't understand contract law, they can't read and write. It comes back to that. You can't enter to a contract if you don't understand what, what it is that you're reading. You can identify if your name is spelled incorrectly, you can identify that. But if you can't, if your reading comprehension is low, you don't understand the contract you're, you're entering to anyways. Why be it? You don't know you shouldn't be in it. That also comes, and it's both sides. However, in some small measure, there has been so many case laws from the Supreme Court saying everything, that, including down to being, there is really technically no criminal charges. No one should be going to prison. You shouldn't be going to jail. But see, the thing of it is when we bring up some of these case laws in our own cases and we put them in, the court disregards them and the prosecution disregards them because part of what we're sitting on, Deborah, is this. And I, I have a video from 1996 from the State Justice Institute Thomas J. Moyer was a Supreme Court judge at that time. And what this two-and-a-half-hour video got into at that time period is that it explained that when a pro se litigant comes to the courtroom and they refuse to hire one of ours, people will bring in the codes, the rules, the regulations, and, of course, they will bring in their Bible. We are to rule against them, and then when they come up for an appeal, we'll back you. See, this is part of the problem that we're running into, and I've got a two-and-a-half-hour video on this. No, no, I'm not disagreeing with that. I, it's precisely, I just said to you, that is precisely what it is. They had to make it appear that they were ruling in your favor, but they had no intention of doing that because you've got a 
this provide another big John Jay going on. This similar things are not to be joined. Therefore, they, there is no mutual contractual agreement here because there's been a breach on your part. This is how they're looking at your trespassing on their property. And so therefore, they're going to punish you, but you don't know those none the wiser because you've been conditioned that these, this court was built on these statutes. So we're going to use them against you because you have none the wiser. I get all of that. I'm, a, I'm with you 100%. You're not seeing that because they see that you aren't seeing very clearly because your reading comprehensive is low. You're not seeing the scheme they're playing over you, and they're trusting you at the same time. Secondly, if you were really, truly sovereign, as you say you were, you anyone knows that really, truly sovereign has never been in the courtroom. And I know a few guys that have never been in the courtroom, and yet they have settled their cases outside. To this day, I settle all of my cases for my clients outside of the court, never step foot, and they pay me ever late yeah. for it when it does, because technically if you claim you're a sovereign or a secure party creditor, everything should have been handled through the mail. I got district attorneys, when they get my paperwork, they call me up and say, Ms. Jones, I've got your paperwork. How do you want to proceed? I tell them, the last time I went to court, and I think I told you this last uh, when we spoke last year, when they were done with my case, the judge turned around and he was livid. He said, you're coming to our courtroom. We don't have Jewish I don't know, on and on and on and on. He just, I mean, <laughs> he ripped a new hole in me when it came to, you're not supposed to be here. Why don't you go to this court? You know, you're a devil and on and on and on. I said, I get that. But somebody was threatening my life. And for that reason, I have every right to exercise this jurisdiction and, and seek protection because I wanted to make sure that the perk that's making threat to me, that he comes through my door, I'm putting a bullet between his eyes. So this is what the reason is. Personal threat, I have right to bring it to a court to mediate. Let this perk know that any time he cuts me the next time, I have the right to pull the trigger. That's all, all right. I'm doing. So, yep. you know, but, but, you know, because I understand how the system is. Here's the other thing. The thing of it is, with, uh, and the, the biggest problem is we're forced to hire the the lawyer on the other side. And ah. because of the oath that you guys took, you know, the people are being taken a disadvantage of and, there, because we're coming in trying to do our own, we cut, we're not accepted. See, this is where really the major, major problem comes in, and all the fact that there is being an investigation done, this is a very positive thing. Well, yeah, I. the other, see, the, unfortunately, what they have used, they twist everything that was supposed to have been good and correct and honest, and, they, and there's just the opposite going on. You don't know you're being treated as a slave, so therefore a slave don't own anything. A slave is a tenant. Everything you do is a pittance. We just, we're just keeping you alive enough like a, mat, like, a, like a mule, enough to give you food and a little shelter from the extremities of the weather, but nothing else. We want everything. Slaves don't have anything. Slaves don't have a voice because slaves can't read and write. And until you demonstrate otherwise, you are a slave, which means you have to put forth the documents that says, I rebut the presumption that you took my car, you took my birth certificate and collateralized and said that you made me out of slave without full disclosure to me. So, no, I don't agree with that. And here's my paperwork that says otherwise. With everything that they give to you, you should have sent a window back to them like I did. Uh, many people who's claiming they're sovereign and who say they're, and they're secure party had to rebut the entire system. You had to come out of this to get your remedy. Of course, your remedy is in their record. It's in their own record. They don't recognize you because we've got a dissimilar thing or not to be joined. We've got flesh versus paper. They are a fiction. You are a live living being. You don't know they're not even supposed to interact. They're not even supposed to see you. That's why the case is technically should have been handled through the mail. Any secure party creditor or any sovereign individual, then there's a few of them out there will tell you, she's correct. I've never had to go in out inside of a court. And there's a few people I know well who's never seen an inside of a courtroom. And they, they run around right here in California with their own plate, their own ID, passport, and the whole thing. I'm also offering that to people who want out of the system. I have the paperwork for people who want to do it the correct way. 
And if, if you want to be a secure party credit, I have the whole thing for that. I that pretty much have the paperwork that what, what, what people want to do. Can I get you the diplomat ID? Can't do that. But I can get you anything else. But you have to come out of that system because for what they see, they can go back many times. Here's the problem. They will go back 20 years and find your signature on a piece of paper that you agreed to, but you don't have anything in their record to rebut that. This is what they're coming at you with. You are a slave. And until you can demonstrate otherwise, go back to the Wizard of Oz when the lion said, how do you act like a king? Yeah, but see, the problem of it is in their system, that paperwork is not openly to where it is available to everybody. It's, it's scattered around in bits and pieces. And that's, that's one of the things that we have found, and through AIB Radio, through the listeners, we have been able to pull bits and pieces that's been scattered. There's nothing in one that lays everything out. Okay, no, 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 no. It's not designed to lay it out for you. If you're claiming that you are sovereign of Yahweh or God or divine, you create that from your within and you produce it to them. You say, no, here's my paperwork. You cannot denounce yourself with their paperwork. They created it. It's theirs. Render unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar. The paperwork that you're going to present to get out of the system that most guys that I've talked to that are real, true, sovereign, created their own paperwork. They will acknowledge because, again, it must be paper versus paper, flesh and flesh, and not paper versus flesh, or flesh and paper, which is a disparata. And this is what they stand on. Okay, there's another factor to that, but we're going to address that, right? I will just stay there because I'm, I'm trying to hammer that home. Yes, people should be told the truth about who the shadow government is. Unfortunately, they were also taken over to the banksters to not to reveal it either. They all been blackmailed. Their family's been threatened. Do you know the 14th Amendment, the several states that did supposedly brought that in? They were held at gunpoint. The, le- the quote-unquote legislator or the congressman that said they claimed that or the states. Yeah, yeah. This, this, talk about that. Yeah. That was never done legally. They were all held by gunpoint, meaning yeah. every member who voted it in, their families were threatened. Some of them were already killed, maimed, uh, to get them to sign that 14th Amendment and then also to the 16th Amendment. They were held by gunpoint. Utah has a case on that. The whole it expo- Utah and one of the states exposed it. Uh, Utah and oof, ah, uh, the three other oh, oh Washington, Washington State and one other state. They have a case law. They have many case law regarding the Fourteenth Amendment. It, they don't recognize it in certain uh, states like Washington. Utah, I think Montana, and a few others, they don't recognize the 14th Amendment. Oh, Ohio, Ohio, and Ohio. Okay, that was done by force. There's many things that we you, you, you have to see the whole side. There's a whole picture. And some members of Congress have said they've been threatened since they've been there. They finally being held hostage and on and on and on. Some of them talked out about it and others did not. Well, see, this is part of what we taught here on, on AIB Radio. We got back into the Reconstruction Act of 1867 where they – made the the southern states and the states sign an oath to the federal government, not the District of Columbia at that time, but the federal government. And when the 14th Amendment came out, they went down at gunpoint and threatened these people to sign and to honor the Amendment side of this thing. Yeah. And whenever they created the Act of 1871, creating that District of Columbia, when they created that district, they were allowed to create a state, but they were never allowed to create a corporation between two states. And when they did that, they relinquished all other state sovereignty and the public offices, and it all got turned over to the corporation when they created the District of Columbia in 1871. This is part of what we have been getting into and laying out on this, but I, you know, 
we we've got into the bankruptcy of 1933. We got into the Federal Reserve Act, where the people were deprived of their money, and they were put into bondage under the birth certificate under the Social Security Act, to where the system has access to our account. They really truly don't need the body when they got access to the account. It's just that the body is just being abused for their personal pleasure. You know, and that and that's that is where the problem's coming in because it's like I've talked to several different people who does trust laws and I asked them a simple question. You were to set up a trust for your child and you're the executor, you are the administrator, you're the trustee, you are the the, the everything in this. Can your child now come in and write a check out of the trust? And I said, no. I said, why? He says, because it isn't theirs. We are in control. I said, that's the whole point here. And that's why, you know, we can't walk in and cut a cut a check, can't write a, a order, because if we are wards of the state by name on under our birth certificate, this is where the problem's coming in of us trying to get out of the system because even though the flesh and blood was brought in under the birth certificate, the court wants to play that game with us on the name deal. And when we're brought in, they want to play that game. And, that, and that's where our problem lies with a lot of this. You know, and I agree with what you're saying under the trust side, but, you know, try to get out whenever they've already got your name into the system. That's where the problem lies, I believe. Uh, well, it, for, for those who believe that it is, but I'm one to tell you, and a few me, like me, are, uh, are completely out of the system. It can be done. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you there was one year that I went, not one year, I took, I experimented with this to see if it could be done. I went underground for 10 years. I resurfaced because I had somebody to talk me in. There was somebody was in a jam, and they seriously needed my help. I came back up and well, anyways, I'm sorry that I did, but I've gone back down. I'm out of that system. It can be done. Again, you're talking about the stuff, their stuff, social security, unemployment, uh, your bank accounts, all that is theirs. Yes. You've been pushing their cost around all your life. Naturally, you're a slave, you're an agent. We can fire and hire you any time. You do as you told. When you need to make some changes, you go to the executive or the trustees. You don't take it upon yourself. You just set it yourself. And until everybody realizes they are in a trust and everything that you have that you believe is yours is theirs, you took it in their name. But as idiom sonus, they trick you by sound. So everything that communicated to you was verbal was verbal. Okay. You follow instruction based on verbal, but you didn't ask to see if you could read it. That made you incompetent. Because if you read it, you could see the fraud. But you went along with it. You said, okay, I'm okay with it. Fine, as long as I have my little bread, as long as I get a little person, as long as I can have a little fun, as long as I can watch a little television, as long as I can have some beer, I'm going to hang out with my friends. Okay, I'm cool with it. Just don't have to fear with me because now we're going to have a problem. Now, suddenly they're kicking indoors and, oh, 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 Now, I know that's a problem. Yes, absolutely, I agree with you. However, you now have to come out of that system to go back to get that remedy. Because everything of yours that you have signed is from their creation. Every contract, every piece of paper, every ticket, every deposit slip, every service utility bill, they can go back for many years and prove that everything you have right now and your family is their creation. This is what they are penalizing you for. You're tipping in the Zabalin a secure party creditor or as a sovereign, and then you, you get frightened because somebody else lost, and then you step out, and then you go back in to them. You're committing fraud. You know, so you have to come out and create your own trust, and you do everything. I've got guys right here in L.A., several of them, 
They have their own IDs. They have their own passport. They have their own driver's license. CHP, do not touch them. They don't touch me neither. And when they do, I show you, sure you want to see my ID, and they let me go. There's a few of us that are living this life now. They're out of the system. They're still here on the soil. Many of them, once they got out, they said, you know, I want to start over. I want to start fresh. That place was a horror zone for me. I want a new life. The senior teacher of mine and several other are living in other South America uh, and other countries. So generally, right. most people, the few that I know that have gotten out of the system are no longer on the soil of America. As a matter of fact, I've had several judges that tell me that said, you know, for those that get out of the system, the best thing to do is leave America. And some of them have known that. Because you're out of their system, so now they can come back. You're out of their system. They can't recognize you anymore. So if they get angry, they can just come up and put a bullet in your head. So some people just do it out of trauma because they said, you know, that place was a hell place. I want to restart. I want to enjoy my life. I can create. I create my own. Do you know when you come out of the system, you create your own currency. You do your own bonds. You can, cro- you can float your own bonds. This is what they don't want you to know. There's so much they don't want you to know. So they're tricking you to believe there is no way out of the system. But as long as you have that belief, that's true for you. So that's why it's real for you. But if you want out, you can get out. And I'm proof and many others like me are out. Well, see, this, this is what we're, what we're looking at here is, how do we get out legitimately on this? Thing? Oh, now that's where I come in. <laughs> I like to have a little fun. I'm sorry. This is where I come in, or many of them like me. You have to produce an affidavit of truth, and there's many. I've seen a few of them on the internet. Some of them are good, and some of them I wouldn't touch with a, you know, with a ten foot pole. That's our problem. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, my has been so good. I mean, I we got the idea by a group of guys that came together, two attorneys, how was it, you know, two judges, three attorneys, and two private individuals. And they created this affidavit. That's why it's very good. And um, it's, a, it's a doozy. You have to put that first. You have to rebut everything. Everything that they have given you from the from time that you were you came out of your mother's water until present, you have to denounce it all and said I did it out of ignorance. If I'd appeared to be incorporated, it was not it was not my intention. That kind of deal because this system is designed to make it look like it's all on volunteer basis. And I'm telling you from judicial legislation executive who told me people want out. They have to put forth the effort because we're not going to give it to them because they are enemy to us. An enemy don't tell another enemy what he owns of them. Okay? You're trading with the enemy. You've got an enemy going on. Don't look to the enemy to tell you what, how you get out. Okay? So you've got to figure that out on your own, and this is how they see it. It is not for them to tell you when you're an enemy. Trading them with an enemy, or you're in the war. You're, 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 when you go out to battle, you see, what you're doing enemy. here is you're actually you're you're validating what we have been teaching here over the last several weeks about the trading with the enemy act on this. But see, that was through deception and fraud on their side to manipulate oh, oh. And the I, people and on I this side. And, and I said, yes, yes. And you know, we we us the people. All right. The, it was the public officials that walked out of their government position to start with. They walked out of it. They they made themselves foreigners to us whenever they took these offices, even though they may not have known at the time. But once they got in, they found out that they were no longer public officials on the constitutional side of this thing. And that's that's part of the problem here. And, you know, we need to be able to correct ourselves to be able to come in, like you're saying, being on the private side, sovereign side of this thing. You know, and, and that is really a major problem because there's so many people out here who have tried, and a lot of these people went to jail. <laughs> oh, yes. Well, because they didn't, there was, there's a lot of steps to this, but there's a correct step. My step is a little shorter than some of it. Uh, we just cut to the chase. Uh, this this affidavit of truth that I 
give to my students when they take the class and they use that have you know most of them are really out of the system um and some i don't know what some of all the other processes that people are using that's landing them in jail i don't know uh but i am told you can get out you have to figure that out because you if you're claiming that you are private then you have to behave privately and not interfere with the public side because you're getting into trouble on their side of the of, 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 of the street. See, there's a private side and a public side. That's all public over there, and that's all fiction. That's all paper. You're flesh. You're not the interesting. So what one didn't know was instead of everybody going and hiring an attorney, you should have gone and got a notary to court with you, but you didn't know that because a notary is the interceptor. She's the mediator between you. It's like... You're handing a piece of paper to a ghost. Well, you need a ghost that the ghost recognizes to be the mediator because that ghost don't recognize you because you you are alive. So that should have been a mediator, but everybody showed up in court with their bar member. <laughs> Anyways, it goes back to, again, reading comprehensive. I, I get that it was all tricked, but at the same time, you should be able to see the fraud like I did. I saw it when I was a police officer. I've got the same pair of eyes like everybody else. I was in the system and say, hey, what did I get myself into? And how can I get out? And I stayed focused. So the same way that I discovered, others have the ability to do so. And this is how they see it, and this is also how I see it. It has nothing to do with their view. It's my view. When I got into being an attorney and other parts of the government, I said, oh, <laughs> I just came from the fire pan into the fire. Oh, now how do I really get out? And I stayed focused. And I let that not to be a deterrent. And I kept on and I kept on searching. My days, there were days that I went without sleep. I sacrificed a lot. You know, come to work sleepy, tired, because I was searching. I had to sacrifice something in order to get out of the matrix. And I'm here to tell you how to get out. And this is not for the faint heart. People are too got too complacent. And they want the easy way. This is not easy. Didn't get it. You didn't get in easy. The way in is the same way out. It's like you eat something that's hot, spicy. The way it came in is the way it comes out. So it took years to get to this place. It's going to... Well, I've shortened it up a little quite a bit, and a few other people have shortened up their version of it quite a bit. But you can ultimately get out if you truly want out. But you can't sit up and think that this is going to be around forever. Now, let me also give you another window. People got one or two years left to get out of the system before it's a lockdown. There's a notice that went out by the Pope. That is the window everybody who really wants out of this matrix, stop working on it now. And then go back and fight the court system. But people want to get out and fight the court system at the same time. And I'm going to help you to get out of the system. I'm not going to help you to go back into the system. They already told me not to go back. I really don't want to go back in there. But, and if I have to, I'll do everything by email or by snail mail because I can do that. I don't have to step court into their place, and, and I shouldn't at this point. They keep telling me this. And when I was an attorney, I, they said, no, 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 we don't like the way you're doing this. We want your card. Okay, you can have it. And then when I got out, and then they go, oh, sorry, we're not letting you out. Oh, wait a minute, we got a problem here. I know how to. I know how to speed up this process. I've been clever all my life, not to the clever of you know doing harm to another. But okay, you want to play this game? Oh God, I got really good at it too. So I now did other things, denounced this, denounced that, didn't feel for this court, and on and on and on and on. Now I'm totally, if they don't come here to this, you don't come to any of our institutions. You're not welcome here. Okay, great. I'm more glad of it. I have been exiled from Washington, D.C. since I was, I've been exiled from Washington, D.C. I am going to go back to Washington, D.C. <laughs> <laughs> so they claim a crime that I committed against that government. <laughs> uh, but yeah, like and, I said, that we know if you know, we could get some of this information to where we could start getting you no know, people educated on this level, and that's what this thing is about. It's about education, people trying to 
fix, get out from underneath the the drudgery of all this. And that's what this show has really been dedicated to is, is the education side of this thing throughout the years that I've done it. You know, and with what you have, you know, with the information you have coming in, exposing you know, th this is this is what the people need to hear. This is what the people need to know from you know from an attorney. And that's what we that's what we said. I said if we can get a get lawyers and attorneys on our side of the fence to help expose this. Because we, and technically, we should not have to get out of our system. These people should have to come back in compliance of what they agreed to when they took these public offices. Then we wouldn't have the problem that we have. You know, and that's and that's that's the truth of the matter. We should not have to get out. These people should have to come back in compliance with their job description. Yeah, I I I'm in total agreement with you. However, this thing didn't just happen overnight. This has been eroded since your eighth president on down, and then when. Lincoln came into office and created the first executive order. It went down here. Instead of the people rising up then and saying, wait a minute, wait a minute, the people got complacent then and allowed them to run amok. You, the people are just responsible because the people voted them in then and they continue to vote them in now. Well, so, you can now. Let me tell you one other thing that people still have that can take them down: grand juries and juries. I kind of was in, in favor of juries, and then I start to research the jury aspect and what jurors are to do. And I found some old laws that most judges don't tell jurors. And it was by the grace of God it came to me, and I thought, Oh my God! All this time, all what's going on, the level of corruption. The people could have stopped it a long time ago. Grand juries and juries. You have three. Under the Republican and the Republican form of government, you have three ways of voting out this system. This is why they want democracy because you only have one. Democracy is socialism totalitarian. But people didn't know that again because that comes back down to reading and writing, reading comprehension. People didn't do their homework. No, I'm too busy with my life. I don't have time to do that. People can't read. So everybody agreed to do this verbal communication. Getting back, they voted, you know, when they go to the polls, that's one. When you serve on the grand jury, that's two. And when you come jurors, that's three. The states, which is the country technically, are the checks and balance. Washington, D.C. is nothing more than the managing of the 50 states nothing but the managing of the 50 states. It has no business dictating what the other 50 separate states should be doing or countries should I say be doing. It's a management. It manages it. And the checks and balances, let's see, we the people, if you say that what you are, we the people, grand juries, you vote at the polls, that's not effective because they now can rig that. But you still have, you still have two left. You still have grand jury and jury. The jury, what the judges have stopped saying, and I couldn't remember why I couldn't remember it. When juries used to come up and people say, I want to have a jury by my peers of a peers, okay, technically the peers of your peers should be people who know you yep. from your own communities, your jobs, your family. That's technically. That's gotten away from. They were able to erode that. And then judges used to tell the jury that you have the right to find it no guilty because what's on trial here is not the person, it's the law. Judges stopped saying that. I forgot about it because I stopped hearing it. And I thought, oh, my God, who has the power right now, people? One way is to get together and start forming juries. Start demanding that everybody have peers of their peers. When I tell people to go to the district attorney and tell that district attorney you want peers of your peers, and particularly people of color, Latino and black, they're going to be hard-pressed to find, when I say peers of your peers, if it's a young man that's being charged, he, there must be 12 young men of his same age 
complexion, level of education, understanding, and everything, right down to the gamut. In fact, there should be, out of this 12, there should be at least eight of them that know the defendant personally. That's how the proper jury should be. That's the proper jury. See, this is part of what we've been teaching into also because we got into the grand jury side and prior to, was it 1940, 1942, the sheriff was the one that had control and the grand jury is supposed to hear both sides of the issue here to where the defendant is supposed to come in, give a testimony, and the witnesses on his behalf be able to come in and give testimony for the grand jury. But that isn't after 1940, 42, the prosecution took it over. But see, the grand jury but, also... But, well, the, the, the grand jury should have been independent of both the sheriff and the prosecution. Neither one of them should be, have been in control of them. It's a separate organization that have, should have been, because they, and grand jury has their own subpoena power, their own uh, investigation, their own separate unit, just like an enforcing agent. And no one should have any way to dictate to the grand jury. You're supposed to have the ability, if you're being charged with high crime and treason, you're supposed to go to a grand jury. The head of the grand jury said, can you look into this? I'm being charged with treason. And neither side, the sheriff or the, the attorney general, anyone, has any say about how the grand jury, con grand jury should conduct their investigation. None whatsoever should be neutral. Okay, now wait a minute. Now, what, what I'm saying here is that the, the sheriff originally – was the original set to call the grand jury to order, not the prosecutor. The, the, the sheriff was to get, gather the people and said, okay, you, you, you're sitting on the grand jury, and he was supposed to walk away on this. Yes. But the prosecution, where they did after 1940, the prosecution is the one that's sitting in the jury room now, because I know, because I went to my own grand jury hearing in D.C., and I was able to give testimony, and that prosecutor sat in there and basically at the end of everything was done he told the grand jury now you have to make your decision based on the laws that i gave you did he or did he not break these laws the fact that i brought congressional records in and showed that the law was unconstitutional the fact that i brought the documentation in and they said i says look we can read all this but we're only allowed to make a determination, did you or did you not break the laws for D.C.? And that's the only decision we're allowed to make. I says, no. You're supposed to sit down and investigate. And if I'm showing you that the laws were unconstitutional and I'm bringing in congressional records on the definition of the word firearm because the prosecution is taking it out of context, and I'm bringing you in the definition of the word person, because the prosecution is taken out of context. As a grand jury, you're supposed to sit here and pay attention to this. Well, that isn't how it worked. But see, this is also what we're getting into the jury side. We try to educate the people that the judge will sit here and tell you, I will tell you how to interpret the law. But well, the moment the judge does that, that's jury tampering. Yeah, well, it was also jury tampering when the, the attorney general told them to gather and the sheriff. Again, that is supposed to be an institution that comes together. It's the, it's the defendant that goes to the and, and acts together. The town hall comes together and says, is there 12 people that I'd like to serve as a grand jury? Not, again, once you have the sheriff, it was easy for it to be transferred over to the attorney general. It's part one of theirs that created that or made that organization. It's not. It is an independent organization, and neither the juror, no, no, the sheriff at that time or the attorney general should have anything to say. It is up to the person who's being charged to go to a member of an organization that, that looks into that, and they determine if it's worthy. Not so that, and that's how you got that transfer of power. The sheriff was able to do it, and then it was easy for them to transfer it over to the to the attorney general, and now we're talking about the district attorney general. Now, in some cases, it's city attorney general. I mean, this is, you know, but however way, again, that goes right back to reading comprehension. Yeah, because, see, and prior to that time period in 19, what, 1940, 1942, there was two functions for a grand jury. One of them was to deal with public offices of their misconduct, 
if there was a complaint to where John Q. Public could go to the grand jury foreman and file a complaint about judicial misconduct or public office misconduct, and there was supposed to have been an investigation. But when this thing got turned over to the prosecution in the 1940s, 42, they eliminated the public office side and just put this against John Q. Public. And that's part of our problem here, is that there is no avenue for us to get to a grand jury on public office misbehavior, which is one of the original foundations of a grand jury, on this. Because I, they go through I, I, think, I think what I'm trying to get to, and I cut you off, because I'm, I'm, I'm monitoring the time as well, uh, you don't, people can, you can raise a grand jury right now without any consent from any legislative branch. It is independent of all the, the quote-unquote laws are there for them to pick it up and run with it if they choose to. It's there. Simply find people that want to do it, denounce themselves, and make it a move. You, got, you, know, you have the jury, the same thing. And I had to educate a few jurors myself about it, about jury, because I said, when the judge starts to dictate to you that, you know, I'm here to tell you, you raise your hand and say, I'm sorry, you cannot. After all, in the courtroom, everybody's in a box. The judge can't hear them, and they can't hear the judge, and the district attorney can't hear the jury, and the jury can't hear them. There's no speaking that's going on. Well, there's not proper communication. Let me put it this way. It's not proper because if you can get into the other way, it's, it's going to take a little longer. There's no proper communication going on in the courtroom. But who has the greatest power than all legislation, judicial branches, and the executive branch is your jury and grand jury. They are not to be dictated by neither of those institutions. They have the power to rise up in each of them separate, separate states. You don't need anyone to tell you to come together and look into these matters and bring it up. You, the law is already there. It's been laid out and it's still there. You don't need it. Just do it. It's the same way you think there's no way out, get out if you want out. You don't look for their paperwork and create it and create another contractual piece of agreement with them. You create it of your own if you are sovereign and under Yahweh or God or divine or whatever you like to call it. The laws, everything about life in the first place is all within. They've taken everything that's within us and externalized it. We got to find out who we really are. It really comes back to, and that's why I say it gets into a larger picture here, of which we don't really have the time to do because we, I need to discuss this for several days because that's not what they asked her here. It's something else. But right now, at this point, they're doing it on the physical level, and on the physical level, you got to know who you really are. And say, so, well, the place is corrupted. No need for me to go there and settle it there. Because once you say no, no is no. There is no contract. And you, anybody, please, run through a red light today. And the cop pulls you over with an Nassar ring and say he goes to proceed to tell you what he believes you may have done. You can say no. Right in and there. He says, well, I need you to sign this. Okay, let me ask you something else, officer. Is that gun loaded? Well, of course it is. It's a gun. So if I should take off, I'm not going to injure anybody, hurt anybody, how would you stop me? I would use whatever force that I need to do so. Oh, wonderful. So anything that I say and do, and I, anything that I read, hear, and say, I've done it under duress. Okay, no problem. I have, a, I have a, I will sign under that under duress. You put a V in front of your name, VC in front of your name, and you proceed to sign. Done deal when you go into court, if you choose to go into court. It's that simple. That it, I have clients that do it all day long. It's a matter of finding it for yourself. Well, see, yeah, this is what happened here in North Carolina. As I got stopped, I was told to get back in my car. I says, no. Well, I got charged for resistance, and I got handcuffed. Mm. And I, got, I got thrown in the back of in the front seat of the cruiser. And then we was taken down, and I was told that you have to sign a $1,000 bond or you're going to go to jail. Mm. You know, but the point of it is, once we got into court, and we and I started filing administrative paperwork right away into the administrative court in Raleigh and into the governor and into the attorney general and into the highway patrol barracks for an administrative hearing, 
we brought up that I cannot be charged for resisting arrest because the law clearly sits here and shows for me to have been charged for resistance, there had to be a warrant for my arrest at that time, and he had to say I was under arrest at the time, and he didn't do any of this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know, when you it, signed that document, of that, did you ever sign that bond? Well, yeah, I, I, I had to sign it, and I got a copy of it. Oh, well, how did you sign it? Well, I, how did I sign it? Yes, yes. How did you sign the bond? Oh, well, I, I signed I, I wrote my name on it. Okay, well, that's where your opportunity would, would have been. Again, um, like I just said, had, when you wrote it, signed the, 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 the ticket, and I have my clients to do it, and I do it, well, until they don't give it to me anymore, so I don't need to do it. You write on that ticket, or anything that requires your signature, you write above it, next to it, underneath it, I don't care, under duress, VC, UO, uh, you know, blackmail, you didn't rebut that bond. Because that was when you signed, you made an agreement, whether unknowingly or not. You didn't put anything else to indicate you did it under duress. These are the little tricks that they get everyone. Well, see, this is one of the things I asked the magistrate for an, for a, an administrative hearing on this. He said, we're not going there with this. I said, this is yep. an administrative issue. He said, do you want yes, to go to jail or do you want to get out of here? Yes, because you've already consented when you signed without putting up a protest when you signed. This is that before was I, a little trick. This is before I signed it. Huh? This is before I signed it. I told him I wanted an administrative hearing on this before I signed the bond. Mm. But see, that yeah. can, this, this is why we need we need to be able to find a, a way to get out of the system. But but what we need to do is find a way of doing accountability. Because we should not have to get out of our own home to turn it over to them. Because no matter where we go, they keep stepping in our place, and we keep moving, and we're, we're running out of places to to step into because they're always right there to take it over. And it's like yeah, I, well, it, I mean, it would help that the people would come together. Sorry to cut you off. It would really help that people would be unified. But they're so been just so distracted. And they've done a very good job at bonding them in that direction. That. You know, myself and others like me, we go on here, we educate these people till we blew in our face, and then when their doors are kicked in, suddenly they remember our names and phone numbers. And then it's a little too late. I used to help <laughs> I used to help put out their fires. I don't do that anymore. When people call me in the emergency, I'm due to go to court. I give them enough information just to handle that court. But other than that, no, you're not going to – because I can't work with people when they're frantic. It's a little too late at that point. It's like going and getting insurance after you hit someone. It's after yeah. the fact. Well, so, you know, the damage is kind of done, and now you have to, there's a back paneling. There's now more double the work. And so, you know, all I'm saying is that there's enough fraud for people to wake up and see, hey, what, you know, what can we do about this collectively? Stop doing this on your own and stop coming together. I'm not saying you, Rod, because I know you're doing a wonderful job getting this out. However, it's the people that you're attempting to lead that's still sitting there and saying, me, 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 me. And rather than, I tell people all the time when I get classes, when I tell a class, there must be four people in the class and everybody must bond right then and there. Those four people, you've got to get to know one another and then trust one another because anything that you do, you're going to rely on each other. This is how my classes are. Nobody wants to play, they don't come. That's how I'm beginning to just, I, I'm trying to, I don't want to force people into it. I got no choice because this got to get done. You can't do it. You can't go out here and be Lone Ranger anymore. The problem is a lot of ego got in the way, and this thing has really turned upside down on its head. And they're picking people apart, and we're running out of time. And so at this junction and stage, everybody just has to say no. Even if they beat and crick and you, I, I've got three guys that I was able to save them from 20 years. They took a beating. They went to jail. They didn't sign anything. They had to let them out. The jet, like I said, they took one guy and flew him around the United States for six months until he found a piece of metal and stabbed himself. So they had to take him to the hospital. And from there, he escaped, called his family. They picked him up and took him right to an attorney. 
the attorney called me because I knew him and say, okay, got him. And I said, okay, good, great. Um, this is how we're going to handle it. You're not going inside. Now, they could hit him with a fugitive, but he'd never signed anything. But he suffered a lot. His hospital bills to prove it. So when he finally got into court and I finally showed him how to do this, and many times I couldn't go into court because I had other people that I had to, to represent, and I was always out of town, he was able to, the judge dropped all, I mean, that was that case, six other cases that they lumped it, tried to lump it together and tell him, you can do 100 years, and he stands on it, and he kept saying, judge, I'm nervous. I got to go take a, I got to go take a bathroom break. And every time he took his bathroom break, he called me. This is what the judge said. What can I do? This is what he did. And they kept threatening him. He's already been bruised. He's been beaten, fractured, bones broken. He never signed that. So I don't care what they do to you. If you want to take the beating, take the beating, but don't sign nothing because eventually they will let you go. So now his paperwork is he's suing them and it's looking pretty good. That's all I can, because I can't speak any more about it, but it's looking real good. Two of them, it's looking really good. One had a gun charge on him. They found the gun in his car. <laughs> He's not doing the 20 years either. That judge dismissed that. Again, he didn't sign anything either. So it can be done. You just got to say no, no, no. And I know nobody's teaching this. No one knows how simple it really is, but it has to appear that it's contractual. So, I'm mean, sorry, well, it is contractual. It has to appear that it's still volunteer. So as long as you continue to sign, even though you say, you know, I've done this, again, you went in there verbally. Instead of saying, I don't accept, and anything I say at this point is going to be under a, a conditional acceptance. People don't know to say that. I, I know that. That's why I'm teaching. So you know what the proper language to say to cut and, and to put it into this presumption, assumption, and opinion. Because they're on a fishing expedition. Well, let me, ask you, let me ask you a question here. You're talking about signatures, which brings up a very interesting issue here. Is this why judges and attorneys and lawyers don't sign any paperwork? They just... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Which violates Rule 11 because all paperwork has to be signed. So if they're not signing it, two parties are lost. <laughs> yes. I'm not as stupid as what I what, no, what some people think I am. I I am pretty much all up on a lot of this shit. <laughs> Uh, yeah, but Ron, you really, really don't right? work. You know, I mean, your fight is a, I give you much credit. I, I really do. Uh, I mean, uh, others like you have gone down in flame, and you're still holding it. You're still holding your ground. So, you know, good on you. And you dug in deep, and you know, my hat do go off to you because we certainly there's no purpose or reason or rhyme for this quote unquote bar association. None whatsoever, none whatsoever. They are administrators. They are the trustees over America. That's all, uh, I'm sorry, oh, uh, citizens of America. That's all they are is the Bar Association. This is why the judge must say you must go and get an attorney. Yep, like I said, because I've been coming back and hammering them on the fact that they don't sign any of their paperwork. If they don't sign it, then there's no paperwork before the court. And the only paperwork yep. before the court is yep. why. If well, they can't rebut, the, it might have well, to be fact. You, you have a dissimilar things are not to be joined. <laughs> <laughs> That's what you got. That's why they don't sign. And you do. <laughs> well, like I said, no, we're, we're, we're trying to go back in because I was told if you follow the rules and they gave me the books and I walked in that day, the next time we went in and I laid out the rules of evidence before Judge Kessler and I laid out the criminal rules procedures and that sits here and says that we have to file paperwork in for pretrial motions. It says here if you don't do it, then you know, you, you lose your opportunity here. And we did the rules of evidence of 402, showing where the Constitution is already admissible as evidence, the federal statutes are admissible, the rules are admissible, and under 501, the same thing. And then we got into 802 under being authentic here, and 902, 
a prima facie law, and I proceeded to explain to her what prima facie law was, and that none of the USC codes in 1925 was passed by both houses because under December 7, 1925, it never hit the statutes at large, but on June 26, 1926, they published it. And just because it's published doesn't make it law. And I walked her through the whole, con- and she crapped mm-hmm. on all this stuff. And I, I explained what prima facie was to her and how they, they cannot bring this in because she has to run under the statutes at large on all of this stuff. And, I, you know, my wife was there, and she was watching this judge sort of squirm and watching the prosecutor and the public defender trying to find a place to hide. <laughs> oh, I can definitely, doctor, I can definitely see that. <laughs> and then we got into the, the fact that we got into the, the Title 36 under organizations and patriot stuff under Chapter 705 under Section 70503 of the Federal Bar Association, and because the prosecutor was not following the Constitution under Title 28, under Section 2255, is that he wasn't answering anything constitutionally or under the federal statutes that the judge had to dismiss my case because he wasn't following it. But under that Title 36, Chapter 705, 70503 section, for disqualification, he was to be removed, and we brought up the Smith Act of 1940 and Title 18, Chapter 115, 2385 of sedition and treason, that he should have been charged for treason in that courtroom. Mm, well, yeah, he should, and you could have said, well, if arrest him, but you didn't do that. Okay, I, there's seven few points that's coming to mind here. You've heard about the Court of Chancery, have you? Big pardon? The Court of Chancery. Yeah, we, we, uh, we, we've talked about it. Uh, we're trying to find it. It's in Pennsylvania. I'll give you the address and phone number. I, I have to find my old uh, phone book because uh, somebody told me they looked it up online and they can't find it. And I'm thinking, oh, no, they, you, you, they, now they're close. So i got to find their address. They're in Pennsylvania. You take all your cases, take it there. Other than that, you need to vacate everything because they, you made so much of controversial there. You guys in Jewish fiction, so that's what they love. But as long as you gave them a life, it, it, you know, uh, you know, we're alive. Oh, here we go, here we go, let's do the dance. So you both, you basically brought them alive. So you, once you discover that you were talking to imbeciles, <laughs> both the district attorney here, and let, let me give you a little tip. In any case that you bring before the court, don't attack the judge, go after the prosecutor. That's what I did. <laughs> So you hang in, you hang the prosecutor. I don't say I said that. Oops, how many people heard that? But anyways. Um, <laughs> you, I've had three prosecutors. <laughs> oh, they're easy to take down. They're easy to take down. So, I, I've had four <laughs> judges, three prosecutors, and three public defenders. But I just, I'm on my third prosecutor now. <laughs> You just got to get, vacate the case and, and um, you know, change. You got to go in a different direction with this. Obviously, it's falling on deaf ears. It's no it keeps keeping it alive on controversy because that's what they're looking for. They're looking for more and more and more, and they're looking for a slip up on your part at this point because they're on a fiction extradition. They don't really know, uh, and you're giving them. You are absolutely helping them out when you cite all those cases, to cite all the, the the statues. You're absolutely helping them how to do their job. And I'm thinking, whoa, look at this. If I was on that side, good little slave, thank you. Because <laughs> this is how they're looking at you. So you don't have them out. You vacate the Francis and now just move the case to uh, Court of Chancery. That would be your best case at this point. Or you have to sidestep them and go to the next and take it out of there. Or do a joinder. I mean, there's several maybe ways that you would like you can do this other than then. Well, from what we heard, the Chancery Court in D.C. was dissolved but they replaced it with a Chinese chancery court. No, D.C. is not the place. No, no, no. It's in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania. All right. It's in Pennsylvania. Yeah, because I have proved so much corruption on their side of the fence of what we've done, how they did everything wrong at this point. You know, and, you know, they're... 
they can't answer any of my paperwork. Matter of fact, they don't answer my paperwork other than the fact that government opposes or government has no standing or no stand. This similar things ought not to be joined. That's why they won't. And they won't. And I keep saying they will not. You're going to be talking until you're blue in the face, until you just drop dead with a. I don't know. I'm sorry to say it's heart attack or stroke because they're not. You you're too far in now for them to now put and start finding anything. That would never happen. And so what I'm trying to save you from with a headache, you're going to have to go in a different direction. It's it's just not going to happen unless, of course, another judge comes in. And there is a federal judge. I have to see if I can get permission and give his name um, who can come in and, you know, you, you, in which you need somebody else from the judicial branch to come in and, and to remove the judges and have the U.S. Marshal there to remove them right then and off the beaches. It's, you know, once they verify that they are not uh, beholden to uh, their oath, you know, according to that ship, uh, they got to show something. I mean, we've got many judges that said, uh, you know, uh, state constitution is rubbish. Uh Uh-oh, that sounds like a banker judge to me who's not gone to judgeship school. So you might have a lot of commissioners on there that they're, they used to put, they were commissioners. Now they're just, just basically putting the sand their judges. When I tell anybody, when you go into court, you need to find out who the players are. It's like a game. You know, you, what kind, when you enter your game, you got to try to get the rules. You never go in there blind. You get, you, you, you go to the state, find out if they're active or in status or they've been uh, sanctioned or whatever the case may be. I have my file. I have every single judge and um, here for San Francisco and Oakland. I have all their files with me right today. I don't go into anybody's courtroom unless I know who I'm dealing with. Well, so I'm, that's another. And the, the thing of it is, you got to make sure they're not commissioners. Their judges are not commissioners. And then it's very members of it. So what they've done is they complicate this thing even further. So they they're really trying to keep this deception going. And you got to keep digging, unfortunately, because you're an enemy, and we're not, we're not going to tell you anything. You're an enemy. Well, that's what we. That's the last document that went in. See, I went from one judge up to Judge Kessler, which was a high-profile judge. And she's the one that did uh, the Madam D.C. of her case. And I got Judge uh, Richard Roberts, which is the chief judge, which is the highest judge in this court, from what I understand, now sitting on my case, and there's nobody higher than him. So I've moved up the ranks. Chancery is higher than Chief Justice. Chancery Court. Okay. Are higher than the Chief Justice. Well, we need to move. And that's, and that's not your true Supreme Court there either. <laughs> that's also in Pennsylvania. <laughs> the thing of it is, if we can get, you know, if you can get a hold of this one party, and you know, if if they would go back in and look at the paperwork with what we put in, you know, and if, if, if we're supposed to be dealing with with court of law, and I know what you're saying here, we're not, but they're allowing the people to believe because that's what they're dragging you in on. You know, and if they'd go back in and look at this thing, and, and they could, you know, they have a choice here because I've had a lot of errors on their side of the fence that they did not do. You know, like the fact that the, the Miranda wasn't read properly. They did the they did an interrogation. The fact that nobody filed an interim appearance into this case, nobody signed any of their paperwork on, on any of this. You know, there's enough here that they could come back on an error and just dismiss this case and let everybody walk and, and go back and hand them their heads to them for being stupid. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, just move to just create the order, have the case dismissed, or vacate void and do something else. You're not going to get anywhere. They're not going to sign anything. They're too far along in this process. They, they're not going to turn around and sign because now you got proof that they have they were they was working in collusion, and they're not going to allow them because you got to go up to because the judge will allow you to take out the prosecutor before she, the judge will allow you to take them out. They'll gladly hand over the prosecutor gladly. Well, that's they will I'm- gladly. They would say, prosecutor, you brought me this mess. You clean it up. Uh, when they get angry, they t- they turn on the, 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 the DA. I've seen it many times. 
Uh, I've had one judge tell the VA, get the F out of my courtroom. You don't want this mess on me. Get out. <laughs> so they gladly hang them for it. Yeah. They are, they, you know, they, they're the dangling. They're the dangling, and you go after the same dangling. Yep. That's, that's what I've been doing. I've been hammering the snot out of the prosecutor. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. <laughs> Got out of the prosecutor. I've been having a snot out, out of the police department. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you do cases, another viable point too is it's well, we're, I mean, they're all in the same boat. Uh, it just kind of makes it a little fun when you bring in. I like to say to people, don't go into court alone. In other words, bring in other agencies that might benefit from this financially. So when you bring in other agencies and when you've got to do, when you do, you know, when you're doing your, uh, 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 when you're notifying each party and they can see that the comptroller may be interested in this or G- uh, Justice Roberts or uh, or the investigative unit of, um, of um, oh, there's another agency. Oh gosh, I haven't used them for a very long time. Um, oh, I can't take up this agency that most people don't even know that it's here in America. Anyways, it, it'll come to me later when they see certain agencies that you're bringing in that may have some beneficial interest in this case. Suddenly, things get quite interesting, quite interesting. So that's another approach that uh, people have to also learn to do. But in all actuality, because it is corrupt and we have a difficult time to get redress, time to have those courts closed, it's time, it's time to vacate order, and, it's, and, and then peer to, because you can go from there directly to the Supreme Court, but they're going to tell you you got to go through the change. You do not. You do not. You can go directly to the very top because of such a corruption. Well, the problem of it is, is trying to get into the Supreme Court. Your chances, of what, from what we're being told, is like one in what, three hundred? One in a, yeah, well, yeah, one in. I was going to say a million, but yeah, okay, one in five hundred, yeah. <laughs> um, but um, but then you got to do, you got to do what, forty books at six and a quarter by nine inch with three <laughs> sides, you know. It, it, <laughs> yeah, they they have you coming and going. I, I, <laughs> Unless you want to write this out on a yellow sheet of paper with pencil and an eraser, and you got to do forty of these, then you send it in with with forty long hands. <laughs> like I said, it's it, 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 it's easier if we could, if if this judge that you're talking about down here in, in Louisiana, if we can get them to start doing some reviews on this international side of this thing, because you and I both know we got these people on war crimes. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We got them on human trafficking. We got them on human rights violation. We got them on war crimes. And it's going to take an international judge that will come in and open this thing up, and I've always made the comment, and I've, I'm proving it in my cases why they're not why they're not answering my paperwork. I could I could crucify these people in a courtroom if we had a legitimate court. I can get a conviction on them because I can prove their absolute corruption, and I don't have a law degree. And you really don't need one because there is not really really no, anyone anyway, really isn't. <laughs> Okay, how oh, boy. But we uh, we've been on it for two hours and fourteen minutes. I don't want to keep you much longer than that. Uh, if you get some more, we can. If you want to take a break, I'll be more than glad to have you back on at another time for some more information. But give you a, give you a break here because that's about what four o'clock your time. Yes, it is four fifteen. Okay. But I want to thank you for if, if you want to talk a little more, we can. If you want to, you know, take a break. You know, we can get off and we can bring you back on a later date. Yeah, bring me back on a later date. I'm, yeah, I because I've been on the phone uh, so much all day and uh, my lips are dry. And my, I'm, I'm out of water here in my office, so i got to go get some. And so, yeah, I will go ahead and like to take the break. But I do want to say thank you for such an opportunity to 
hopefully uh, some of the stuff, what I said or you said, have sinking in and maybe perhaps aroused the people to start want to look in a different direction and start gathering their friends and family to, be, to become more active in this because we we got to work as a unit. We cannot do this independently. There's no lone ranger out there. Or spite what the fiction television shows you, tell lies, tell lies to your vision. Um, that's not there. We've got to work together, and you've got to create an organization that wants to build because uh, everyone is being effective. You know, it was once the point of time they were stereotyping stereotyping, you know, groups, but now everyone is being affected regardless of their race and creed and economic status, Every, you know, and people are being affected by it. So now's the time. If you can't rally around this, then I don't know what it's going to take for people to come together. But you still have two elected votes still in place, and that's grand jury and jury. That will take them down. The jury, the grand jury, has they're more powerful than all 1,200 presidents, especially juries because it comes from the community base, from the 50 states, and they've got more power than 1,200 presidents, so all the uh, Congress, all of the Supreme Court, and all of the executive branches together combined, the jury does, they have that much power. And so uh, for them to be reduced in the, in the role that they are, they ought to know that what's on law, is, what's on trial is not really the individual, but the law itself. Is it constitutional or not constitutional? And then they look at the facts. But, and they can do both, where the court has to stay in honor and the judge or the prosecutor have to bring about the facts. But the judge, I'm sorry, but the jury can have to hear both law and facts where no other institution can't weigh on those two. Only the jury can do that. Well, the only thing that I'm finding, Deb, on this is this, you know, and I agree with that, but we can have a grand jury indictment, and like I said, there's myself and there's some of its whole position as private attorney general, and I went through Congress, I got mine stamped. But if we don't have a courtroom with an honest judge to get the conviction. And this is where we're falling short. We can have all the grand juries. We can have all the private attorney generals and bounty hunters out here. But if we don't have a courtroom to take them into. I, I got to say, you, there's another point, and that's incorrect. If you have notaries, Three notaries can have court equivalent to any court on this land. This is what they don't want people to really know. That's incorrect. Okay. Notaries can That's have what court. I wanted to hear from you. Notaries. Because we have talked about this before with notaries being able to override any court decision. Yes. Yes, all day long. Notaries are equivalent to the court of chancery. As a matter of fact, of speaking, there is a court of chancery in every each of the 50 states because they don't want, and some attorneys don't even know, and most judges don't even know which courts really are in each of these 50 states. You won't know because technically there is, but they don't want you to know. The court of chancery is the only standing court in America that stands firmly on the Constitution. They cannot lose any other manner, no other manner, and yet they keep those courts cloaked. So we want to knowingly know, which is the, the chancery of court is in, is in Pennsylvania. And I've got, I've got to look up my address, and I've got to find my old ad, ad, uh, address book because I actually wrote to them and I called them. And so they're there, and I, I presented a few cases there, and, and the decline I had didn't want to go through it because they just was exhausted. So, but anyways, it's in Pennsylvania. Uh, the filing fee is four hundred and fifty dollars, is a little higher than the uh, the other uh, courts. And uh, so, uh, it's the process is somewhat a little easier than actually going to the other court. And you can transfer any case, whatever, and it's equivalent of being uh, heard in the same state. It has that power. So. The notaries have identical power, just three or more. They have identical power, and they don't know it. I was telling this notary this morning, do you have a notary in Mandarin? He says, what is that? I said, did you just say you were a notary? Yeah. 
and you don't know you have a notary manual? He says, no. I, I, I says, I'm having a problem. Why every, there's quite a few notaries, and no one seems to know they have a notary manual because that's where your job description is, and then they have you know that. Perhaps you know that you can overrule and take cases, overturn case, cases yourself, the notaries, and none of them know, very few know there, they have, there is a notary manual. Very few. All right, because see, we've talked about this. The problem, and you're right. The notaries, the notaries do not know their job of what they're doing. Yeah, not at all. They have no clue. Can't read. Can't write. <laughs> well, the, the thing of it is that they're scared. As part of it is that the state would turn around and come back in and take their take their power off of them. That's they, part. Of the they, yes, the government. I'm sorry, I keep saying government. The corporate used the fear of loss. But when the notaries notarize one another, they cannot. But they don't know if they have that power either. They cannot, if other notaries are a witness, they cannot use the fear of loss. This is why they give you slaves. <laughs> I can say that now. Lie. Then. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I, I, I sometimes I maybe I have a you know a sore sense of humor, or, you know, difficult sense of humor, or whatever you want to call it. But I kind of like to laugh at these issues because it's it's um, I can laugh about it. But anyway, because that's a method of controlling how you do what you do, your behavior, defining your job, and you know what role you to play in your job by making making it mandatory that you have a lie then or a permit to commit to a, a job that is technically illegal to do in the first place. We're giving you permission to do something illegal, which is basically what a life lie and is. And, so, and then we can also use that as leverage, because you've been accustomed to making, your, your, that's been your line of work for 15 years, so we use, the, we use the leverage of fear of loss, and suddenly you're going to do what we tell you to do. Because now suddenly who's the person who's been licensed to do whatever they are for 30 years, fine, going to find themselves, I don't know what I'm going to do. I said, well, I've been doing this for so long. I've I got to remain out. Oh, 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 Take 10 deep breaths, count backwards, slow it down. They got you where they want you. You want to continue this for the, for, for, from, from cradle to grave? That's make, that will make you a good little slave. And this is why they go, systematically go on across now, you know, to be a food handler, you need a permit for that. They're finding ways to use fear of loss because right, now, now they, see they're losing ground on people. All right, let me ask you a question here. No, no, no. Because we've heard about the notary power, and and we've heard about the grand jury stuff. Now, if the notary signs and we get the indictment on judges, prosecutors, all right, what what power do we have to force the sheriff to arrest these people and incarcerate them? It's in the notary manual, and it's quite lengthy. Oh, they have to are here. To it, they are the front lines. The, 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 the sheriff are supposed to be respondent. When the courts are defunctioning, they have to turn to grand jurors and jurors and notaries for correction. All right, now, is there any? If, if you do a grand, if you do the notary, is there an appeal that can be done on their decisions? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Or is it all right? Because. The thing of it is, that's where the problem's coming in, is if we go back in and they go to their their appeals court, we know their judge is going to overturn their decision. And that's uh, what, uh, the notaries don't need to go to that of the institution. They have the power. They are the court. See, no. okay, oh, okay, let me, let, me, let me digress here for a little bit. Okay. What I'm asking you is this. If yeah, the notary... no, 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 yeah, I need to explain something to you. Okay. Your court is not that building that they call 
uh, district court number 10 or 20, uh, district court 26 or in Louisiana, that's not court. Your court that you establish is, 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 is four square corners. It's called a piece of paper. The cargo on that paper is your, ve- the, I'm sorry, the piece of paper is your vessel. The cargo on that vessel is your court. That's a building you're entering to. It is not the proper court. It is not court at all. I just want to let you know that. I want to clarify that for everyone. That really isn't a court. You are court. The right. vessel, the piece of paper, the sign, the sea of space, because this is about admiralty. See, the ship came onto dry land. That in of itself is illegal. So now everybody's running with illegal from the very beginning. You've got to trace it all the way back to the Vatican. They brought in admiralty when they discovered how to cross the seas and recognize all the vessels on the water. They brought that in on the dry land, and the people went along with it. So it goes back to there. So now what you're dealing with is the ship in dry land. So this is why they say dock, der. Everything is a dock. Everything has the end ship, friendship, love ship. God shifts. <laughs> They're telling you something. Everything is based on admiralty. Anything with a ship in the end of it is that they're giving you clues. You're dealing with admiralty. Dry dock. That's why they say when you go into the ship, which is the court, that built not that court, that building, you're no longer on the shore. You're in foreign land. That's why they do what they do. You have to distinguish that. You're in a foreign jurisdiction. That's where you really are. I didn't bring. I, I didn't dwell that home enough. So I want to be very clear. When you go into that building, you are on a foreign soil. And when you come out of that building, you now have stepped back into the American soil. Yeah. The court that you bring is in your hand. That piece of paper, the cargo. So you get into word spells. You, you you're treating. <laughs> Sorcery. When you go into the building, you're practicing sorcery along with them. They're practicing black magic, and you're along with it. You're being summoned, summoned before the dead. The judge wears what? A black robe. When we bury our dead, well, who, what do we wear? Black. Yeah. You've been well, summoned, you know. Because what I, was, what I was getting at is if the notaries do the convicting on this, Yes, I they just can. want to make sure if the judge, prosecutor, if they got charged and got thrown into the county jail, could they override the notary decision by going to the appeals court on that? No, they can not. That's what the I wanted to do. has the same status, the same authority as that of a court of chancery. This is why they use fear of loss by insisting that they be licensed to fear of loss because they, 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 obviously they didn't even know that there's an instruction manual for them to tell them the many various job description and the, and the authority that they have, like the jury and the grand jury. That's they don't what know I want. either. They, they have Trump. All you need is notary three or more and a jury or grand jury. That's your court. You don't need to go to their building. Again, you're going to them for permission to use, continue to use their facility, their paperwork, their things, their material. You click back and forth to get their permission to do anything. <laughs> you got to come out of that thinking. Well, I understand Every- that, but I, you know, and the thing of it is that that's that position belongs to me because they came to me and asked me for a job and all we got to do is go down to the election board to prove that or go back and show where they filed for an application for that position you know yeah like i said no i i understand what you're saying on this but they they, they twisted this whole thing around and we oh, need to be able to come back in if, if the notary if we can get our hands on the notary manual. And most of the stuff that I've talked to a few notaries, they're about as thin as the Constitution. Very thin. <laughs> Very little power. 
<laughs> and they are fighting like a mouse. Oh, oh, I tell them they're recording. Oh, 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 oh. Why is you walking with you? Are you being possessed? <laughs> the least people. And it takes, uh, don't get me started. Don't get me started. Well, I, I understand. But like I said, but no, the, what you what you put out is what I was trying to find out here. And this is something that our audience needs to know. Because we do have notaries within our ranks out here. And I guess we really need to get get the manuals, and we need to go take that notary position for ourselves so we can work together yep. in order to yep. do the the proper court setting on this. Yep. You should create a group. I don't care how many is in it. Well, you want to keep it leveraged. You want to keep it not too big because then it starts to get this, you know, dissension and all. But, you know, you can get... Up to ten people in the group, two out of that two or three should be notaries. In every group, there should be at least two to three notaries. There you have court. Any disagreement is can be settled and resolved with those three notaries there. Absolutely. Yep. That's court, not the building that they call. That's their creation. Even though it took flesh and blood, man and woman, to create that, to dig that, to construct those buildings on the beast rock. We've done that for them, and then they turn around and pay us with anti-money, and then they slap their name on it. Yep. And then they copyright it and patent it and did all these other crazy stuff. So now everything that we are doing, we're accessing theirs. The utilities we're paying is theirs. You know, all this stuff, city hall, theirs. What are ours? How can we prove that we are sovereign and we secure party creditors when we got nothing and everything that we have access to is theirs? So prove to me, and this is how they, and this is how they're coming at you. Prove to us that anything here is yours. Bingo. Yep. All right. Well, let me. Like I said, this this has been interesting. This 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 last half hour was really with on the knowledge of the notary, the grand jury side is really what we're looking for for an enforcement on this side and educating the sheriff. We need to get our hands on the notary manual. That's what it sounds like. Yes, you do, and badly. <laughs> yes, you do. And you need to retrain those notaries and let them know what true power they really have and then start gathering and calling for jurors and grand juries and get it up and running and then start asking for, okay, we can't move, close these courts down. And suddenly there's somebody's going to really start having some changes of heart now because that's, that's what they fear the most is courts being closed down. <laughs> yep, I know. Okay, that like I said, we need – do you – whenever we get off, you get a chance to get on the Skype, send me some stuff over. Do you have any, where that notary book is at that we can get our hands on? The, the thick one, not the little cheap thin one. Oh, no, I have, I believe, I don't like to use the word to believe. i got to look and see. I, it's a possibility I may have it. And I have the thick one. <laughs> I have the very first copy. Uh, the copy, the, the first edition that was created. I think there's only one. Maybe there might be another edition, but I have the very first one. The very first one. And would you, would you, would you, you wouldn't believe that the notary, Manual is thicker than the IRS code manual. <laughs> you're saying the, motor, the oh manual they give you now is better than the constitution. But they really played. The notary manual is much thicker than the IRS manual itself. <laughs> well, this is what we need. This is what we've been looking for because I've been telling the people that we <laughs> need the manuals because everything they have is in a manual. We get our hands on the manuals, we can beat them. That's right. All day long, yes. every day, 24 hours a day. We need the manual for all this stuff. Okay, well, I don't want to keep you much longer. I don't want to throw you off, but I don't want to keep you on here much longer because I know, like I said, you've been on the phone all day, and so have I. <laughs> yeah, and like I said, it's, been, it's very, been very interesting talking with you, and it's been a pleasure because you really – you're coming across – on this stuff with a lot of information that's very helpful, and that's what we need. We need more help of how to expose and how to come after the system and correct the problem because it will only take 
one or two convictions on their side of the on their side of the fence before they decide they don't want to play no more. Mm-hmm. And I am trying to set things up where we can get one or two convictions on their side of the fence so they don't want to play no more because we should not have to give up anything. It's like I've told the people. It's like you have in a mansion and you have a servant's quarters out back and your servants have taken over your home. They've taken over your bank account and now they're dictating to you and you have to wait on them we should not have to leave our home to get away from them. We should be able to put them back into servants' quarters. I happen to agree with that whole statement. Now, let's get into creation here. God created all things. So everything belongs to what? The creator. Yep. Everything we have, let's be very clear, they create. Yep. So we got to get into perspective. Everything you're pushing around is theirs. They declare themselves bankrupt. It's, it's equivalent to uh, they're hiding their assets. And they, you know, you, you, you hear the thing where people go into court and they put up a trust so it wouldn't be out of the reach of the creditors first. <laughs> well, that's simply what they did. <laughs> That's essentially what they did. They created this. We dug it from the earth and we, we constructed it for them and they turned around, slapped their name on it, paid us with anti-money and then turned around and then penalized us because we want access because they tricked us using contract law and uh, because we couldn't really read and write because we didn't extend ourselves until so it comes down to comprehension. So they tricked us thinking that we had ownership but in fact, we didn't realize, those of you didn't realize anyway, because everything I bought, well, it's not mine. I always knew that. I paid with their their script. I've always never been, never. I never had a problem with because I knew I was accessing commerce. It was all, everything of theirs. So any vehicles, any homes was paid cash. I wasn't pay, doing no loan and any of that stuff, doing any credit because everything, I, everything that I would have made extra creations for would only make them more lucrative. So I, I limit everything that I did. Uh, to the point that I stagnate everything. They, make, they ain't going to make but so much money off of me because I already know the dance here. So I wasn't willing to get, play with it, play, play it along and think that ignorant is bliss when it's in fact bondage and there's a heavy price for being an ignorant. So nevertheless, there, everything that of you believe that is yours when in fact you construct it should have the ability to claim it, but they took it from you by paying you anti-money and you didn't realize it was anti-money because you can't read and write. And, and then they slapped their name on it, and now so they took claims. You can't trump that. So well, no, what you've got to do is give, back, give them back and then create your own. Create another entity that they will recognize, and suddenly you've got the same toys, and suddenly <laughs> there's, a new, there's another ownership here. You, anyways, the, the wealthy already knows that you don't own anything. You just control everything. Because this whole big plan, everybody's afraid to own anything. It's not just the, the it's not just the average individual. Wealthy people are just afraid. They don't want their name on anything. Everything is family, you know, the family empire, and everything is in a trust or a foundation or some kind of entity. But none of them take claim to it. Only the the people who can't really read and write and say, "This is my name." Well, yeah, and, and that's understandable because you work for it, and you know, you, you, it's supposed to belong to us originally. When it's, because when we was under gold and silver, it did belong to us. Exactly, exactly. And when they put us under the the Federal Reserve side of this thing, and we was handed Federal Reserve notes, this is part of what we're trying to get into. But it's like I've told people, all right. The Social Security side of this thing, when we were working and we had jobs, it wasn't an option. It was a, you either pay or go to jail. But Social Security is basically an insurance policy. It's no different oh. than going down to work. And that's hey, the same I, with the VA. I am so sorry. Just, uh, uh, Ron, I oh. am so sorry. It is 4.30. I got an appointment in 20 minutes. I have got, I, I'm so sorry. I've got to go here. <laughs> oh, my God, I forgot. Uh, okay, this is really good. We do have to continue this. I have 20 minutes to get to another business meeting. I'm sorry. I have to end it here. Much right. love to everyone here. Thank you so much, but I've got to go. <laughs> All right.
Bye-bye. Thank you. Okay. Bye-bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope what we got here for information here tonight, you know, she's right. We're going to have to pull together. This is not a, a long ranger setup. This is, and that's what I've been telling you people. We are going to have to start pulling together. We're going to have to start working together. We need to get our hands, what she, what she was saying, on the notary books. We need to get our hands on the original notaries and get our notaries educated. If we need to step in to get ourselves into that position where we could work together to help one another on this. That may be the answer we're looking for. It's the notary side. And she's also talking about the chancery court. That is the other side of this fence. And we've been bringing this stuff up. So, you know, she's basically telling us and confirming what I have been bringing up on so much of this. And I'm glad because we need people like her that is that is an attorney, that is a lawyer, that is starting to see the light to start coming over and helping us on how to go after and correct the system and correct the problem on this. We've been on here for almost two hours and 45 minutes. We're going to go ahead and close this up, but before I do, I want to remind you people at, at the end that we're going to have this judicial reform here in North Carolina, the Denver, at Cross Country Campgrounds on the 25th, 26th, 27th. Ladies and gentlemen, I realize money's tight, but I also realize education is valuable. Education needs to be given out to the people. That's part of what this some that's part of what this judicial conference is. It's education. The number for the campground is one eight hundred eight five two forty eight forty. That's one eight hundred eight five two forty eight forty. Get a hold. Come on out. It's just $200 a person. The education is, is worth every bit of it and the knowledge that we're going to be given and dishing out. It's your life, your freedom, your choice. You can either fight them now and not have any knowledge, or you can fight them later when you have the knowledge. It's better to get and not use it than it is to be hammered and wish you had it. Choice is yours on all this stuff. Thank you, and you all have a nice night, and have a good day.